You're listening to the Plane Talking UK podcast, the UK-based podcast written by a passenger for anyone. And here are your hosts, Carlos Devings, Matt Smith and Neville Bounds. Well, hello and welcome to episode number 186 of the Plain Talking UK podcast. I'm Carl Stebbings and not joining me in the kitchen studio this week is Matt Smith. We've given him a holiday because he's under the weather and he can't be here with us tonight on the show, unfortunately. But he's probably watching at home laughing now because of all the technical issues that uh, we're having this evening on the show. But don't panic because uh, we have got uh, someone with us to give us a hand just in case things go wrong. And it is obviously the king of AV and technical stuff. Welcome. It's our fellow co-host, Neville Bounds. Well, good luck with that, matey. Anyway, yes, hello, everybody, and uh, great to be on the show again. And I uh, can't believe it's a week since the last one. It's flown by this week, hasn't it? But, uh, yeah, really, uh, really pleased to be back on, and uh, we've got a lot to talk about tonight as well. So uh, looking forward to it. We certainly have. And joining us uh, on the show tonight is another fantastic guest host for this week, and he is one of the hosts from the APG show, and you've heard him a few times over the last few weeks because they have released a 1,000 episodes. It's uh, obviously, he's got a beard. It's Captain Nick. Oh, hello there. It's not quite ho 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 season yet, but getting there, isn't it? Mm. Hi there, Carlos, and uh, hi, Nev. Uh, pleasure to be back on your show. It makes a nice change from uh, spending four hours doing an APG. <laughs> but yeah, we have churned out a few, but luckily we've got a nice break now before the next one, which I'm assuming will be sometime mid next week. But uh, no, it's great to be on. Brilliant. Loving the poster behind you, by the way, Nick. Yeah, love, love well, I know. Poster. Some very nice Blake sent it to me. <laughs> and I, I did my best to mount it. Uh, and uh, there you go. It's uh, pride of place now with a lot of lovely Airbuses on it. So how are we all this evening then? Nev, I take it you've had a, uh, a fantastic week as, at work as always. A busy week, yes. A bit of uh, medical lark uh, earlier on in the week. I had my yellow fever injection for my uh, trip to Brazil, which made me feel particularly ropey yesterday. Um, yeah, so I'm off to Brazil on Saturday week for a week for on business. Uh, but yeah, we've been very busy at work, uh, lots going on. And uh, we're just coming to the end of our financial year, so the, the pressure's on. We've got to invoice everything, including the table and chairs, properly. Oh, uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's a bit hectic this week, I have to say. So, Nick, flying? Have you been flying anywhere nice? Uh, I, I recently come back from an Atlanta, uh, where I met up with Captain Jeff, and we did the last uh, APG show, just Jeff and I, because, unfortunately, Steph and uh, Dana were both busy but you know it's really nice to do a show when you're there in person with the uh, uh, the creator and a chief host of the show um, you know it's just it makes it a lot easier bouncing off with you should like listening to you and Matt together when you're in the <laughs> normally in the show I mean it's much easier to uh, to have little quips and enjoy each other's company so that was brilliant had a few beers with Jeff and uh, we did that slightly high over uh, I flew back, and then uh, I very recently, uh, I yesterday and the and uh, the day before, uh, uh, joined up with a really uh, old friend of mine. We joined the air force within days of each other, did a lot of our flying training together, and our careers have paralleled reasonably closely. He spent a lot of time uh, in Hong Kong flying for Cathay Pacific, but um, he's retired now, and he's just moved back to the UK. And he was kind enough to give me some of his time because he has a fascinating story to tell about uh, the largest aviation industrial action, uh, industrial dispute, I suppose is the best way to put it, uh, that has ever occurred uh, at Cathay Pacific. And uh, he was the president of the union. So he knows an awful lot about that obviously and uh, the story is a fascinating one with uh, it's quite a tragic story as well so um that's gonna um form the next i think three at least plain tales so uh wow. there's a bunch of interviews one after the other but sometimes it just goes that way looking forward to those nick because uh, i think everyone who is anyone watches uh, and listens to plain tales every week and so we all really enjoy them so uh very much looking forward to those. 
and I won't listen to them whilst I'm driving my forklift. Anyway, <laughs> joining us uh, in the chat room this week are a whole host of people. There's loads and loads of wonderful people in the chat room. Tony S, Liz Piper, Andrew Wilson, Jordan Rose, official Ben Pat, Lane Street, Mark Harvey, Mariana, Owen's in there, Dr. Steph's in there, keeping an eye on Nick. Uh, <laughs> we've got uh, t- um, uh, Myla, the lovely Myla's in there as well. I'm just going through the list here. I'm just trying to Andrew Wilson, Big Ron, uh, Don Sebastian was also in there. I don't know whether Don's still in there or not. Uh, Jenny Parkinson as well in there. I hope, uh, hope everything's okay in the wonderful Rome. And uh, yeah, so thanks to everyone who's joined us uh, in the chat room. I missed your name. I'm awfully sorry, but I'm trying to do 400 things at once. Where's Matt when you need him? Oh, anyway. Um, so I suppose we ought to really start the show then, uh, as we do each week with our rundown of the weekly news from around the world and the UK. So if you're all ready, guys. We are ready. Yes, Let's I go. almost certainly am. So, kicking off this week's first news story, then on the Belfast uh, Telegraph.co.uk, this one. And uh, the headline This airline finally replied to a passenger nine years after he tweeted them to suggest a new route. And yes, I did say nine years. So I think most of us use social media for complaining or tweeting or talking to everyone uh, around the world. But uh, this story has come on this week and uh, an airline has replied to a potential passenger nine years after he suggested it to start flying to Hawaii. It was back in t- uh, May 20 or 2008 that uh, David Ratz first tweeted Southwest Airlines to ask for the new route. Uh, now, the airline has apologised to Hawaii-based rats for the delay, revealing it will be flying to the islands. Uh, the airline wrote, uh, uh, David, we know it's been a while, but we're going to Hawaii, and we want you to be one of our first flights. The Twitter user had made an appeal to the airline requesting Southwest fly between the islands and to the mainland US saying, we're hunting or hurting for good fares. Uh, the Dallas-based airline finally got back to him uh, as it shared details of its intention to fly to Hawaii uh, following a company conference in California. Uh, the airline has replied to several other potential passengers who had requested the airline shake up the market, but, they are, <laughs> but there are more recent tweets. Uh, the airline's chairman, chief executive officer Gary Kelly, said we're ready and excited to address a request we've had f- or heard for years. Uh, and in Ratz's case, it's really been years. Uh, Southwest still needs to gain Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, approval for the routes, but tickets will go on sale next year with full service details announced at a later date. The airline currently flies to 99 destinations in the US and nine additional countries. It operates more than 4,000 departures a day and the US's largest domestic air carrier based on Department of Transport figures. Its first flight was on June the 18th, 1971, oh, that's a few years ago. And if you're wondering how Rats responded to the news, he took it in his stride. And uh, the twi- they've shown the, uh, shown the actual tweet here, and uh, you can see where on here, uh, well, I can't put it on the screen because I haven't got that bit to work, unfortunately, because Matt's not here. But uh, Southwest did send a tweet uh, replying to him, said that, David, we know it's been a while, but we're going to Hawaii, and we want you, to be, uh, want you on one of our first flights. Uh, to which David uh, replied, Mahalo. I'm guessing that means something nice in uh, in that uh, in Hawaiian language. What do you think of this thing, guys? Um, I mean, social media, tweets, and stuff like that. Uh, it's um, it's nice of them to reply to them, I suppose. Yeah, it is, isn't it? And uh, it's quite interesting that uh, um, where I work, uh, we weren't really sure what the purpose of social media was going to be for our company. Uh, but, uh, you know, very shortly, we realised that actually it's very valuable indeed. And you need to, you know, reply to people and you need to keep the conversation going. And um, it's hard to imagine now, isn't it? What would be happening without social media? How, how, would, we, how would we be running our lives? Um, now, some people say there, there's too much social media mrs nev certainly says that when i'm uh, <laughs> tweeting away whilst having me dinner and having a glass of wine so uh, uh but uh, what do you think uh, nick 
I I think uh, there ought to be just one social media so I can keep track of it. Yes. It's not it's not that there's too much on any of them. It's just that there are so many different platforms and flitting from one to the other is always the problem. By the way, uh, mahalo means about time to you idiots. I just looked it up. Um, <laughs> Uh, but no, seriously, it uh, actually means thanks, gratitude, admiration, praise, esteem, regards, and respect. So all that in one oh, word. That's a pretty neat word. I might have to learn that one. You heard mm. it here first. But social media, I think more social media is more and more becoming a way of uh, for people to get in contact with companies, especially airlines. And uh, I think lots of people now use Twitter to um, to kind of vent their their um, anger when they have have a bad flight experience. It's very yeah, effective, I, isn't it, certainly? I mean, you certainly get a reply because they almost certainly have someone permanently monitoring. But whether that person actually pays any real attention, I don't know. I mean, uh, you might just as well ask the cabin crew, you know, why are we late? Because uh, tweeting it, you're probably going to find out less information. But there you go. <laughs> So moving on to the next story then. And uh, Nev, uh, this one is specially for you. It's a BA story, and we normally like those. And actually, this is a good news story for a change uh, on the uh, aviationpros.com. And it says that British Airways is welcoming more than 1,000 students as part of Work Experience Month 2017. Students will get to experience the airline's world-class facilities and speak to colleagues at its engineering bases at Heathrow, Cardiff and Glasgow and its Global Learning Academy Training Centre. Uh, and uh, the students will will meet and learn from the carrier's professional operations team at its Heathrow T5 operation, including customer service staff, turnaround managers, and baggage loading and cargo specialists. BA professionals from across the company will share their experience and expertise with the students to give them an insight into how the airline delivers its hugely complex global flight operation to more than 200 short-haul and long-haul destinations, maintaining world-class customer service services and the highest level of safety and maintenance on its fleet of more than 280 aircraft. The airline is committed to encouraging the next generation of talent, both male and female, in operational areas, as well as customer service and head office positions. And its leading role in the Work Experience Month has helped many people gain a career in aviation, including on the airline's extensive apprenticeships and graduate schemes. The airline's continuing campaign to encourage more female applicants to pilot and engineer engineering roles sees current female flight crew attend schools, colleges and recruitment events throughout the year. BA Chief Executive Alex Cruz says this is a fantastic opportunity for any young person with an interest in aviation and we're extremely proud to be supporting the initiative. We strongly believe in inspiring future talent and we're privileged to be able to share our decades of experience and modern facilities with students from across the UK. The travel industry is a, has a huge amount to offer and we hope that this will be a first step in encouraging tomorrow's leading aviation professionals including flying crew, customer service colleagues and engineers. BA engineering apprentice, uh, engineering apprentice uh, Max Rand who went to the airline's work experience program when he was at school said uh, as I was still at school I never had any experience of the world of work. The work experience program was a fantastic opportunity to gain an insight on how a major airline may maintains its aircraft fleet. The time I spent at BA was so inspiring that it led me to apply for the British Airways Engineering Apprentice Programme. And BA's senior global PR executive, Fran Catling, who attended work experience at the airline before joining the company, said it was a great way to get an idea for what a career in the travel industry could offer. And as a student, you don't necessarily know what different jobs involve. So this type of experience can really help you decide if it's right for you. There's no substitute to being in the actual environment, speaking directly with professionals who are experts in their field. I'd absolutely recommend it to anyone who gets the chance. And I'd certainly agree with that. I have to say, if you get a chance to operate in, in any form of business, really, uh, as a student or when you're still at school, actually seeing the... Uh, the professionals at work in their own environment it does give you some inspiration as to what you might want to do later on so uh, yeah a good news story there for a change yeah I, I really wish that you know back when I was at school that I was offered a kind of work experience like this because 
I think it would have definitely uh, pushed me to uh, to do a lot better than I did. I think at school, but it's 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 also nice as well to see that you know it's just it's not just pilot work or pilot jobs and stuff that uh, are on offer in the aviation industry. There are other other aspects of uh, of aviation which are on offer to to people as as the story kind of kind of says with the uh, mm. uh, varying different sort of jobs and stuff. Um, what do you think, Nick? Well, this is the sort of thing that motivates people, and as I'm sure we're all well aware, motivation is the key to uh, pursuing a career. And if you have got that germ of uh, of motivation, that you know that real desire to go and do a particular job, there's very little that'll ever get in your way. So I think it's great. Excellent. So Nick, the next story, as you're there, is uh, is a special one for you. Uh, oh, yeah, this is the Daily Post. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's all about um, the Airbus Beluga. Um, so this is the Airbus Beluga XL, and it says it will take to the skies. Well, thank the Lord for that, because it's an aeroplane. Um, so the first Airbus Beluga XL Super Transporter is on schedule to take off next summer. Airbus announced this week that the first of the five new giant transporters is well advanced in the build-up process. I'm assuming that means they're putting it together. That's probably Airbus speak. <laughs> uh, derived from the freighter version of the Airbus's A330-200 jet liner, well, if it's a freighter, it's probably a jet freighter. Um, the Beluga XL is six meters longer. That's quite a lot, actually. One meter wider. I guess that's to fit the fuselages they're going to stick in it. And uh, has a payload lifting capacity six tons greater than the current Beluga A300-600ST. Well, I expect those 300s are getting a bit long in the tooth. And it's, uh, I'm sure, nicer to have all the um, whistles and bells that are in the uh, A330 being a much more recent and advanced design. Um, let me see, at Toulouse, uh, Blagnac in southwest France, the home of Airbus's primary industry facility, three quarters of the number one Beluga XL structure assembly has been performed for the outsized aircraft. Uh, Eric uh, Belloc, who heads the Beluga XL final assembly activity, I love, I love this. It's great, isn't it? Who wrote this? Um, said all elements for the aircraft specially designed tail section have now been received. So it's a, a Beluga's a whale. So I guess it's a fluke they're sticking on the back, is it? Um, <laughs> these are due to be integrated on the number one airframe once systems, mechanical and electrical integration, which is currently underway, is completed. First Beluga XL's takeoff is scheduled for next summer ahead of a 10-month flight test certification campaign and it's due to enter service in 2019. So another big fat effer is going to take to the sky. Is this uh, an aircraft you'd like to have a go? Obviously, you you are the Airbus aficionado here, uh, Nick. So um, you know when you eventually do leave Acme Red, uh, is this a kind of job that you wouldn't mind doing, flying this uh, freight dog around? Uh, let me think about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, uh, I think we should have a quick word with Miami Rick, who actually drives the Dream Lifter around. These oversized aircraft are pretty restricted in what they can do because of the vast size of the fuselage and the amount of weight they carry. Um, they're an odd-looking machine. Uh, they do fly, but within quite severe limitations of uh, turbulence, crosswind. They're usually completely unpressurized. Uh, they may have a pressurized cockpit for the crew, but the body is usually unpressurized. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it looks a bit of a uh, well, it looks a bit of a nightmare, and I don't suppose it handles very well. So I th other than saying, "Oh, I've flown a big fat aeroplane," uh, <laughs> no, I don't think I'd be terribly keen to give it a go. Uh, Nico Nico Riga in the uh, chat room has said that uh, the the platform is based, as we said, on the A three thirty two hundred. That's uh, I mean that's one of the um, the variants of the E three thirty. You've flown yourself, Nick. Uh, yeah, we've got the 33300. I guess the 33200 well, was a little smaller. It's probably it's probably one they had kicking around that you know perhaps a prototype or something that they used and 
can't think of what to do with it. So let's stick a huge barrel of beer on top of it and uh, fly it round, making it look silly. Any, any uh, thoughts, Mr. Bounds? It's a, always a fascinating looking aircraft isn't it and i didn't realize actually about the press pressurization side of things as, as well there so as, as nick says maybe the uh, the cockpit is pressurized but obviously the, the rest of it doesn't need to be because it's a it's a freight animal but um yeah it, it's i mean it's always interesting to to see it uh, in the air or, or take off and land isn't it it's a very very unusual shape there is, uh, on this article, a very nice video, by the way. So uh, if you want to direct your viewers to it, they can hear the Airbus take on it with lots of nice music clinking, plonking in the background. Hmm. <laughs> nice. So moving on to the next story. And uh, as we all know, today's date is Friday the 13th, which is probably why we had so many technical issues today, to be fair, guys. <laughs> the, uh, but, uh, anyway, so the story is on the telegraph.co.uk website, and uh, uh, it's a headline I think we actually did run, uh, I forget when it was. it was, it might have been last year or the year before on the show, but uh, Brave Passengers Board Last Ever Flight 666 to Hell, and um, today, Friday the 13th. So fearless flyers will laugh in the face of superstition today when they board the last ever flight 666 to hell on Friday the 13th. Travelling on the unluckiest day of the year could save you some pounds, but a journey uh, straight to hell on the 13th hour of the superstitious date is one, of the, uh, one flight most would probably like to avoid. Uh, Nordic airline Finnair has flown brave passengers from Copenhagen, Denmark to Helsinki, Finland on Friday the 13th since 2006. However, today will be the last time Flight 666 flies to hell as the airline has decided to retire the flight number. Today will actually be the final time that our AY666 flight flies to hell, a spokesperson for the airline said. Uh, as of October the 29th, some of our flight numbers in our network will change and our AY666 flight from Copenhagen to Helsinki will change to AY954. In 11 years, we've flown 21 times the AY666 flight to hell on a Friday the 13th, they said. Uh, thankfully, veteran pilot Jua Pekka Kidasto says he's not superstitious or scared about flying on Friday the 13th. It's been quite a joke among the pilots, he said previously. I'm not a superstitious man. It's only a coincidence for me, he said. If there's some passenger who is anxious about this 666, our cabin crew are always happy to help them. Flight 666 is set to depart from the Danish capital, uh, and that actually departed this afternoon at 1.20pm, uh, and is scheduled to arrive at Helsinki shortly before 4pm, so hopefully it's, it's there. Uh, but why is Friday the 13th considered to be so unlucky? It has biblical origins and has always been, also been linked to the Knights of the Templar. And it is uh, soon will be actually soon will be time for Halloween. But um, uh, <laughs> flight six 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 to hell, guys. Uh, any any thoughts? <laughs> mm. Well, I've been to Helsinki a few times in the past. Not on that flight and not on that day either. I have to say, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a shame they're retiring it actually, isn't it? In many respects. <laughs> Oh, I think it's a great, great uh, novel flight number, for heaven's sake. And going to hell, that's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I'd be the perfect ticket to send one of your employees on. Get on flight 66 and go to hell. <laughs> yeah. Are you a superstitious man yourself, Nick? Do you believe in all the uh, hocus pocus? Uh, no, I, I'm neither religious nor superstitious, so it w wouldn't worry me at all. However, <laughs> uh, I, um, I do um, not walk under ladders. I watch out for black cats. I tap wood regularly and uh, various other bits. Oh, yes, and I always tug my floor lock when I see a single magpie and say, good morning, my lord, good morning, my lord, good morning, my lord. So, no, I'm not superstitious at all. What about you, Nev? <laughs> Give, I, given, I used to be. I, I, I'm no longer now, I have to say. Uh, uh, so, uh, no, I, I just don't have any superstition whatsoever. So you wouldn't worry if, you're, uh, if your next flight was BA666? Uh, uh, no. Uh, going from gate 13 on Friday the 13th, <laughs> no, wouldn't bother me in the slightest. I'd only realise it after the event, probably, as well. <laughs> 
I, I could have flown today, and I must admit, I would have pitched up going Friday the 13th. I'll do I have to. But uh, I, we all make a joke of it when we get one of these flights, because I've flown on pre- plenty of Friday the 13th, and the flights have always been diabolical. <laughs> so, Nev, the next right. story is all for you. Yeah, this is from the uh, telegraph.co.uk, and it's... Um, just described as the world's most useless airport is finally getting getting its first scheduled service and St Helena's uh, 285 million pound airport dubbed the world's most useless after a series of setbacks will finally welcome its first scheduled service on Sunday an SA Airlink flight from Johannesburg with up to 68 passengers on board is expected to touch down on the tiny Atlantic island at 1:15 p.m. local time following his historic seven-hour flight, including a refuelling stop in Windhoek, Namibia. Uh, The first flight for the weekly service running each Saturday will mark a new chapter in the history of the British Overseas Territory, which sits more than 1,200 miles from the nearest major landmass and is usually accessed via a five-night ocean crossing on the RMS St Helena, uh, one of the last working Royal Mail ships in the world. It should both islanders and uk authorities will be hoping represent the final chapter in the meandering saga of saint helena airport which has involved a decade of delays overspending of taxpayers cash and accusations of incompetence the british government first announced plans to build an airport on saint helena in 2005 but problems finding a suitable construction firm and financial pressures brought on by the global recession meant contracts were not signed until 2011 the airport officially opened in June 2016 but with a major proviso large jets cannot land there due to dangerous winds on uh, April the 18th 2016 a test flight operated by Comair for British Airways saw a 737-800 need three attempts to make a successful landing and for more than a year only small private planes were cleared to use it an official report last uh, year said it was staggering that the impact of difficult weather conditions was not foreseen and described the airport labor by some the world's most useless as a 285 million pound white elephant that uh, serves neither its people nor the taxpayers footing the bill that figure works out at nearly 63,000 pounds for each of the territory's 4,534 residents and a first commercial flight operated by SA Airlink using an Avro RJ86 and with 60 uh, paying passengers on board landed last May but that flight which was delayed by an hour was only run because two RMS St Helena Voyagers were cancelled so the ship could undergo repairs. The opening of the airport was originally supposed to see the Royal Mail ship retired and it will now stop plying the route uh, in February and authorities Authorities in 2015 uh, ambitiously estimated that up to 30,000 people a year could visit St Helena once air links were established. However, SA Air Link's weekly service will only be uh, only amount to around 4,000 passengers a year on each leg, and that's if the flights are full. And today, the, the Travel Telegraph was still able to find tickets on for the inaugural service uh, with one-way fares from uh, £395. Well, I, to be honest with you, th- this airport has had some problems in the past, but it's actually no more difficult, really, than Gibraltar, I suppose. I mean, there are a, a lot of... Uh, very odd winds uh, there as well. I suppose the advantage with Gibraltar is if it all goes wrong there, they just go up the road to Malaga and then they, they coach the, the passengers uh, to and from. But uh, it, this is a bit more tricky because there are far fewer uh, options for diversions and, and, and things like that. But uh, gladly glad that it's uh, finally open. Now, I've managed to get uh, the uh, desktop capture to work, I'm pleased to say, whilst you've been reading that story, Nevin. Oh, just, just look at the runway. I've just got the picture on the runway for those of you in the YouTube chat room to see the runway there. And uh, I've got to say, it's it looks like at the end of the runway, it's... Um, probably time to stop when you get towards well yes end. but i mean it's just like gibraltar that, that's got um a lot of sea at both ends of it and it is only a six thousand foot runway at uh, jib um and also with very uh, odd atmospheric conditions as well so you don't want to be uh, floating it down the runway for a, <laughs> a nice smooth landing no. you, you, you want to be uh, <laughs> getting it on the, what do, what do uh, on the piano Nick? keys and, and i might point out carlos that when you get to the end of the runway it's always time to stop <laughs> So you don't think you get a 340 in there, Nick? I mean, I don't think that runway looks... 6,000 feet? Yeah, I reckon so. 
Ah, there we go. There's one for you to try, perhaps, uh, over the next few weeks, Nick. Uh, I think not. I, I love the bit <laughs> where uh, it says uh, it serves neither its people nor the taxpayers put in the bill. I'm trying to work out, even if the airport was a success, how it would serve the taxpayers. I don't, I'm a taxpayer. I don't think I'm going there. What's going uh. on? <laughs> Well, we're all paying for it, of course, in the UK, because it's a British overseas territory. So we're Well, exactly. Some, like, so I'm, I'm trying to work out how it serves the taxpayers. <laughs> yes. it, it might serve the people there, although it hasn't done much yet. But uh, no. there you go. Perhaps it's cheaper crashing a few airplanes on it than it is keeping that old boat going. There you go. So <laughs> moving on, this next story then, uh, Nick, it is all for you. Uh, that must be emergency escape slides. Oh, now, yes. Yeah, emergency escape slides on your Airbus jet might be broken. <laughs> dun, 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 says Bloomberg. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so the pumps used to inflate the emergency slides on some of Airbus's biggest aircraft might not be working. A safety, pardon me, regulator has warned. So it doesn't mean they are not working. It means some might not be working. Hmm. An inspection has found that some of the pumps or aspirators on the A330 and A340 wide-body models were damaged with cracks or leaks in shut-off valves caused by the improper folding and packing of the chutes, according to the European Aviation Safety Agency. The slide may not perform as required in an emergency evacuation scenario, EASA warned in a bulletin, whilst the planes have multiple slides and exits and are not considered unsafe, a number of cases in which damage was discovered means that maintenance firms should be alert to the issue. How is this a your escape slide might be broken when it can they quite clearly say they are not considered unsafe? Uh, I don't quite understand this story. Uh, the aspirators are, anyway, they're built by United Technologies Corporation uh, of Goodrich, Goodrich unit, are usually inspected once every three years. Similar instructions were issued to airlines and engineers in 2011 concerning a problem with the slides on the A320 narrowbody model. So it sounds like they're finding a few snags on these things, which, quite honestly, they're, they're packed up and, and, you know, you only need them like an ejector seat. You, only, you probably use them once in the aircraft's life unless you're a cabin crew member and want to get off your aircraft with a beer in your hand and run across the <laughs> tarmac thereby uh, leaving the airline um, uh, so you would quite like them to work and it looks like they will work so this is a little bit of a non-story I think I don't think you ever want to test the slides anyway to be fair Nick they, I mean, they're, uh, they're, they're damned expensive to pack up again that's the big thing mm -hmm. if in case I mean plenty work. of people have accidentally tested them there are an awful lot of people that uh, yeah, I've seen it happen at Heathrow, driving you know, around the airport on a bus. We suddenly noticed all the fire trucks were arriving at a Malaysian 747, and to see that one of the, someone had blown a slide out of the back. So, uh, yeah, oops. So, moving on to the next non-inflating mm -hmm. story, and uh, this one is uh, is on the Yorkshire Post, and um, a bit of, bit of a sad story. We covered it a little bit last week, and um, it was the final Monarch plane leaving Leeds Bradford Airport, and uh, it was a poignant moment for former staff and customers of the low-cost airline Monarch. And uh, so, according to the story, uh, this. Uh, the last title, the last Monarch aircraft uh, to fly, has left the UK. Uh, this aircraft, which was based at Leeds Bradford Airport, uh, is uh, well, it's left to begin its new chapter of its operational life. The empty aircraft, registered Golf Zulu Bravo Alpha Papa, took off at 1:40 p.m. today for the final time in Monarch's livery. Uh, it's thought to be heading for Norway following uh, the airline's collapse. Monarch's 35 strong fleet are likely to be sold or leased to other airlines, having been grounded since the start of the month. The pilot of another Monarch plane performed a farewell wing wave gesture when departing Leeds Bradford runway for Shannon in Ireland early this month. And uh, the, the well, the pictures have been taken there apparently, but I can't get the pictures up on the screen. Well, we get one of the pictures up on the screen there, but um, sad times it was uh, indeed uh, for Monarch, as we all know. And uh, but it's 
you know, hopefully everyone who's involved in the in the uh, issues and stuff which uh, have happened have, uh, are going to find jobs flying nice shiny new Airbuses, eh, Nick? Well, they they might not be quite as bright and shiny as the ones they had. So, uh, I mean, those Airbuses were in good nick. They had a Monarch. Uh, they always look very smart. And, yeah, I think it's just sad to see that uh, Monarch's um, profile, they're... they're, they're What's it called when you have a particular way of operating uh, an airline? Their model, their yeah, it just didn't work. Now they used to give a good service on board. They used to be able to go on holiday with them. You had a decent amount of legroom, had a good service, nice number of cabin crew, but they have just been priced out of the market by people who are just unwilling to pay that little bit extra for having uh, a no hassle flight. So I hate to see uh, airlines like Ryanair actually winning, but they are. Uh, And it's all just down to the price. And often, Monarch, we're still very competitive once you realize that you were getting uh, all the perks and frills that they had on board their aircraft. If you tried to pay for all those on a low-cost carrier, you'd find the prices weren't that much different. So I just think it's a damn shame. It is. And, uh, of course, we're talking about people's jobs and livelihood here as well, Nick. But I'm guessing that with uh, both flight and cabin crew um, certified on the A320 and A321, uh, for European operations at least, that gives them some options in terms of the the sort of carriers that are looking for uh, qualified uh, on on that kind of aircraft. Oh, I think Monarch was a well-respected airline when it came to the quality of their pilots and cabin crew. So I would hope that they, all, all of those guys and girls will will uh, easily get jobs. But if, if you're a pilot, um, particularly those who were senior captains, for example, um, it doesn't matter. When you go to a new airline, you drop to the bottom of the pile and you have to join as a junior first officer. There are very few opportunities for getting a direct entry command, as we say. And even then, you certainly won't be on the pay that uh, you would have left uh, Monarch yeah. with. Hey, sorry yeah. for the junior guys, perhaps, who have just joined the airline. You know, they may have only had a, a short amount of uh, seniority. And so they just switch airlines. So... Uh, but it, I feel sorry for the guys that have been there for some time and tried to make it a career. I was uh, within a week of joining Monarch um, back 20, 23, 24 years ago. Um, I might have been flying with Captain Alice, one of my buddies on the airline. Um, uh, but uh, at the same time, the airline I did join came up with an offer and I weighed the two up and decided I was going to go with Acme Red. But uh, if I decided or if the Acme Red hadn't made that offer to me and I'd gone to Monarch, I'd now be out of a job. It's a, it's a shame. It's a shame. But uh, as, we, as we know, uh, you know, one of, our, one of our, our sort of listeners and one of our very good friends of the show and that uh, he is, uh, he's going to find something uh, fabulous to fly, no doubt. Hopefully he'll find a Boeing to go to, uh, Nick. I think he has got plenty of irons in the fire, <laughs> and quite honestly, so long as uh, Captain Al gets the job he wants, I won't uh, hold it against him if he ends up flying a Boeing. But I think he's got a few offers, and I think he's just weighing up uh, which one's likely to be the most favourable for him. I'm hoping we'll get some good news before too long. So Neville seemed to have dropped offline there. I don't know where. Yeah, was it something I said? I don't know. Neville has seemed to disappeared. Uh, I've no idea where Neville's gone. Mr. Bounds, are you still there? Calling Mr. Bounds. Calling Mr. Bounds. He seems. He seems to have dropped offline completely. Nick, what are we going to do? Uh, I'm not. (laughs) I'm not sure. I guess we carry on regardless. We carry on regardless. Okay. So the next story then. uh, Actually, this should should have been should have been Nevs, but um, I'll have to read it. So the the uh, story's on the Metro.co.uk site, and uh, the headline. Oh, the headline is uh, someone brought a dog on a plane, and people loved it. So we all hear about the uh, the the well the. um, the pets and stuff that you can bring on board aircraft in the US. But someone has brought a dog on a plane and people absolutely loved it. At least most of them did anyway. Some were upset with seeing the adorable pet on a flight, which is baffling to us. Uh, I've got a picture which I will put up on the screen in just a second, but um, uh, the story is then that uh, this particular pet in question uh, was um, brought on a British Airways aircraft 
and uh, it says here that rules vary depending on which airline you travel but with uh, but with this is what British Airways says about taking dogs on a plane so apparently assistance dogs if you're traveling with a recognized assistance dog it can travel with you free of charge in the cabin of your BA flight uh, this service cannot be booked online and you uh, they need to limit the number of dogs that they can carry in the cabin other pets and emotional support animals uh, all other pets including m emotional support animals will need to travel in the hold as cargo but don't worry your furry friends will be just as comfortable in there as they would be in the cabin because it's all in a nice controlled environment all of the cargo areas are handled by our sister company IAG World Cargo and they have decades of experience transporting animals and will look after your pets as if they were their own so there we go so um, pets on planes, Nick. Uh, I didn't realise so, this, this happened in the UK, but um, obviously it well, does. Well, yeah, there, there are a few um, where well, you have to have a, a properly registered uh, animal that is normally a guide dog, um, but, uh, the, you know, the, you can't just go along t and get a a uh, certificate of the internet or get your local vet to write a letter saying, oh, I desperately need my dog with me. Um, that, that is not going to work on most of the UK airlines. It has to be uh, part of a very short list of uh, re properly registered uh, assist uh, dogs. So I think, you know, this, if you were an injured serviceman and you had one of the d special assist dogs that uh, were you required to, you know, help feed you or help look after you and do things for you, or obviously if you're a blind person and it's your uh, seeing eye dog, as the Americans call it, um, then they are allowed on board. Uh, I personally would rather have uh, some dogs on board than many of the passengers that I see, um, and <laughs> I would be very happy to have this particular dog on board my airplane as he looks absolutely gorgeous, doesn't he? he? does! He looks fantastic. I, I, I did so, pop the picture uh, on the screen there as you were doing, as I was always, you were talking there, Nick, yeah. so I could see it. It is, uh, is a lovely What Nev, you've joined us again. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. I think someone was mucking about with my internet connection. But um, anyway, so yeah, the uh, the picture of that dog. Um, there's a caption competition opportunity there. I would have thought with the dog saying, "Yeah, it's all right. I have actually paid for my own ticket." Uh, so he's yeah, looking. Or, or I'm about to recline my seat. Yes. <laughs> yeah, what What are you going to do about it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> great. No, it, it's super. Um, it it does kind of kind of annoy me that, but it doesn't affect me that people can get on board uh, in some countries with the most ridiculous animals, which they claim they're essential to them to calm them for travel. Whereas we all know that the great majority of these are just people who have pets who want to try and travel around the world with them and can't be bothered to pay to have them put in the cargo hold because that procedure is often a lot more expensive than bringing your dog into the cabin. Um, so they, you know, they drum up these uh, claims. Obviously not in every case, but it is uh, a, a distinct possibility. Have you, uh, have you ever taken any of your uh, amazing dogs on, uh, on board aircraft, eh, Nick? No, no, uh, I'm sure they would be well behaved, but uh, no, we, we just <laughs> holiday down in Cornwall with them, and they just go in the back of the Volvo, and we drive down there, we usually rent a nice house that'll take dogs, and then they get plenty of walks on the beach, but no, I've never bothered flying. I mean, they're, they're, all, um, they're all injected up and got uh, the, the right chips on board, so they could get pet, pa pet passports and do it. But uh, the majority of these are either dogs perhaps going to uh, dog shows, but they're in the hold, uh, or people traveling with pets, and they're usually in the hold. And these uh, special assist dogs, the, the ones that are certified and uh, assured uh, that they are absolutely needed, uh, are the ones that travel in the cabin, and usually they, they're fussed over by everybody. I can't see why anyone would get upset. <laughs> So moving on to the next story then, and uh, actually, Nick, uh, uh, this one is yours. Uh, so this is Flight Global, am I right? Yes, it is. It's is is A380 fleet overtaking 747 a hollow victory? 
Well, I don't know. Are the 747 suddenly going slower or something? News that the A380 fleet now exceeds that of the 747. Oh, okay. We'll have been met with mixed emotions in Seattle. Oh, poor Seattle. Poor Boeing. Oh, what a shame. They, they're scrapping 747 so fast now, I guess, that there are more A380s around. So, the decline of the original Queen of the Skies or as I like to call her, the Dowager, uh, as a passenger airliner, at least, relative to its nemesis, is not a milestone that Boeing will have been savouring. But the circumstances in which it has been, oh, sorry, which has happened certainly vindicate the U.S. manufacturer's long-held pessimism about the size of the ultra-large airliner market. When Airbus launched the A380 in 2000 as a game-changing double-decker to usurp the 747, the jumbo passenger fleet totaled around 740 aircraft. But production of the 747-400 was already in decline. Based on its assessment of market dynamics, Boeing told Airbus it needed its eyes tested if it truly believed there was sufficient market to invest in the launch of an all-new ULA. Uh, the Airbus was convinced that congestion and infrastructure constraints would force the, se the sector to shift upwards to cater for growth. By the time the 380 made its service debut in 2007, the 747 passenger fleet had declined to 550 units, even Airbus must be disappointed that it has taken the 380 10 years to overhaul its rival, especially given how slow sales of the 7478L. Is that 8L? Intercontinental. <laughs> so that's the Dash 8, yeah, yeah. airliner version. Have uh, how been so they they no they've hardly sold any of those a few uh, I think they sold one for Miami Rick to fly around <laughs> in but um, in their cargo only so with the entire big jet A380 versus seven for the seven passenger fleet now standing at a little over four hundred aircraft the market has indeed shifted but the wrong way for Airbus well yeah they joined the market a little late the aircraft was laid in. It was slow. Uh, do you remember that they had built two halves of it? And when they tried to put the two together, they found that uh, the um, software they had used to get everything the right lengths, particularly the cables and all that kind of stuff on one half of the aircraft built, wasn't the same standard as the other half. So when they oh. tried to join all the cables up, they were like an inch short. <laughs> was, it, was it done on a Mac? No, probably. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can't leave it, Kenny. Can't leave it. <laughs> well, I mean, if it had been done on a Mac, it would actually have worked. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and if uh, you had a Mac now, mate, we'd probably be seeing some <laughs> decent pictures up on the oh, screen. Hold on. Look, there look. There we go. Look, there's one for you. Look, there's a picture. Oh, really? There oh, we go. I did pop that one up while you were doing the story, actually. But it, that picture does go to prove that the, uh, the uh, 7 4 does look so much more nicer than the 380. As everyone so in the chat room will agree. More nicer. So much more nicer. Well, you know, it no. looks better. Looks better. <laughs> it's a Suffolk slat, a Suffolk twang, Nick. Suffolk twang. Uh, no, nah, I'm. Well, I'm afraid when it comes to passenger comfort, you can't be the 380. I'm not kidding. If you uh, if you are travelling uh, with a great unwashed, uh, as I do many times or have done many times in the 380, it's a lovely experience. It's quiet, unlike the Boeing. It's uh, it's roomy, unlike the Boeing. It's, um, it's very stable, unlike the Boeing. It's got uh, great <laughs> entertainment systems, unlike the Boeing. Um, it is just such a more modern aircraft. It's got that beautiful lighting system. It's uh, very atmospheric. It's a super aircraft to, uh, to fly in, unlike the Boeing. Nev, you must be proud there because that picture there had the, uh, obviously the, the, both the BA um, products sitting there. 
Yeah, I think the, the only thing I would say, and I'm a, you know, let me put my cards on the table here straight away. I'm a big Airbus fan of, of all types, but um, the 747 does look better than the A380. Ha- 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 having said all that, um, I'm, I've not yet flown an A380. I would imagine, though, it's a very nice experience. So I'm looking forward to that one of these days. Um, so, uh, yeah, but uh, it, it's, yeah, the A380 just looks a bit sort of chubby and it looks as though it could do with a stretch, doesn't it, really? If you want to put another sort of 50 feet on the fuselage or something. But uh, <laughs> there we are. That's, that's well, I have no around. doubt, Nev, that if uh, the, the sales uh, had hit their original targets, that's exactly what they'd have done. Yeah. They'd have brought out a stretch version, which would have, would have looked a lot, a lot more elegant. But yes. the fact is that uh, that'll be the only double decker we'll probably ever see, and uh, proper double decker, mm. and that's that. Mm. But mind you, if uh, if I think Boeing had built the seven four with a full length double decker, it would look just as stupid. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm just trying to see the the comments in the chat room here. Uh, Mike has put the comparison I want to hear. Uh, is the uh, with, with the uh, 787 to the A350. Hmm. I, I, I think they look very similar, actually, the, the, three, uh, the 350 and the 787. I, I don't, the 350's got the Zorro mask on, as we all know. Mm. Yeah, but, that um, makes it look kind of cool. I quite like that. Mm. And apparently Jonathan Warner says, uh, like the 340, the 600 looks so much better than the 300. Uh, yeah, I must admit, I think the 300 looks very akin to the 707, and we all thought that was pretty impressive. Um, the 600 does look uh, a very elegant, long, slim, elegant, with nice, uh, beefy engines. So I guess that has its, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a beauty queen. Actually, Richard King in the chat room said that haven't a few 747s lost an engine or two? Well, just recently, uh, some of the A380s have lost uh, an engine piece or two. Oh, yeah, but I was just... uh, Funny enough, I just found um, APG 190. uh, It's kicking around in my podcast list, and for fun, I listened to it. And we were talking about a 747 Iran Air that got airborne and an entire engine fell off. So... uh, (laughs) Um, yeah, I think the 747s had definitely had a few uh, come tumbling off. Ah, but but not to forget the 747, Nick, that had all four engines flame out to only restart them again and carry on flying. I didn't get them all going for a start. Well, got, and the first thing going. was they flew into a bloody volcanic ash cloud. <laughs> so, excuse me? <laughs> well, it, it, it landed safely. Everyone on board survived, Nick. Mm. Oh, they were fine. Yes. Ro- Rolls-Royce products as well, weren't they? Uh, exactly. exactly. And yeah. I would say more to the skill of the pilots than the ability of the aircraft. Yes. I think uh, Captain Eric Moody and his crew that day did a remarkable job, didn't they? They did. They they should have just been given the rest of their lifetime's pay and a big packet and said, that's it, guys, you've, just, you've done yeah. a great job. Yes. You can retire now. <laughs> So moving on to the next story, this one is on the Telegraph site and uh, the, well, it's uh, the final Fokker, and I said Fokker, how these iconic aircraft are disappearing from the skies. One of the more enduring relationships in aviation history is about to end. KLM, the Dutch flag carrier, is preparing to bid a fond farewell to its last Fokker aircraft, marking the final chapter in a partnership that has lasted 97 years, almost since the dawn of flying. Fokker, founded uh, in 1912, went bankrupt in 1996, but its aircraft have remained tireless workhorses of KLM and many other airlines since. However, the time has come, says the Dutch airline, for the two to part company. KLM is currently celebrating its Fokker heritage via the medium of aircraft liveries with a message that reads, Fokker, thank you. And its tails fins emblazoned with an image of the man behind the brand, Anthony Fokker. The airline will also create a film and photo gallery of its final Fokker flight on October the 28th when its last Fokker 70 touches down for the final time. What is so important about the Fokker? Well, Anthony Fokker is hailed as one of the most important entrepreneurs in global aviation history and earned a somewhat predictable name, the Flying Dutchman. 
His first propeller-driven plane, which he designed and built in 1910, was called Disbin, or the Spider, and was flown for the first time in 1911 over the Dutch town of Haarlem. Uh, one of the earliest aircraft manufacturers in the world, Fokker, the company, began life in Germany where Fokker believed there were better opportunities than this uh, than his home nation before returning to the Netherlands. Its initial success was in providing aircraft for the German First World War effort before it found its stride in the international or internal wars uh, before. Uh, before becoming the largest company of its kind by the end of the 20s. In that time, Fokker was behind the 1925 um, aircraft used by 54 airlines and as much as 40% of the US market by 1936. The company launched its last aircraft, the narrow-bodied Fokker 100 and sister, the Fokker 70, in the mid-1980s. They have since been used by some of the world's largest carriers, including American Airlines. KLM is the world's oldest airline and, is, uh, and its first aircraft delivered in August 1920 were two Fokker F2s. Its first flight in 1919 was in at least de Havilland DH-16. It's since operated more than 160 of the manufacturer's aircraft. More recently, KLM's Fokker 50s and 100s have been replaced by Embraer aircraft, but eight Fokker 70s, all between 20 and 22 years old, still remain on the airline's City Hoppers subsidiary, running between Amsterdam and a host of European cities. So uh, there is a list here on the uh, story for the world's oldest airlines. And uh, or we haven't got the music to play because I haven't bothered to add that in. But um, so in a, a number, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Oh, oh, sure. <laughs> we should just put the Patreon music on. But no. In the, in a, so at number ten, it's uh, Lot or Lot Polish Airlines. They were formed uh, in January the first, nineteen twenty-nine. Number nine, Nick is Iberia, uh, and they were in June the 28th, 1927. And number eight, Air Serbia, June the 17th, 1927. And uh, number seven, Tajik Air, uh, September the 3rd, 1924. And number six is Acme, uh, formed on uh, May the 30th, 1924. And uh, go on then, Nev. Number five is uh, Finnair, uh, which is November the 1st, 1923. Hmm. Number four, Czech Airlines, October the 6th, 1923. Aeroflot, apparently, are number three, February the 9th, 1923. Number two is Qantas, November the 16th, 1920. And as the story says, KLM, October the 7th. And uh, that was 1919. So there we go. Fokker, there's one of these um, aircraft actually at, uh, I think it was a Fokker 27 at our, our local museum here at Norwich Aviation Museum. Um, I haven't actually ever had the chance to fly on on, uh, on any of their aircraft. Nick, I'm guessing you probably have uh, had a chance to fly on a, on a Fokker. Uh, let me think. No, I've flown in plenty of others and some I've called a Fokker, but <laughs> I'm not actually one made by Fokker. I've Never. flown on a, a lot of Fokkers, actually. <clears throat> and um, the first time I did so was from Heathrow to Rotterdam on a Fokker 70. And I didn't realise at the time that both the Fokker 70 and the Fokker 100 <clears throat> are capable of flap zero takeoff. In fact, most of the time, uh, with the runway length that they have available at Heathrow, they do a flap zero takeoff. And it's always was a little bit disconcerting when I'm sitting on that window seat and we're just lining up on the runway at, on 27 right or wherever it was and you'll notice that the flaps have not been deployed and i was very concerned on that occasion <laughs> but um yeah both of those aircraft capable of that i used to fly on the fokker 50 extensively uh, for many years back in the 90s uh, between copenhagen and north in sweden uh, when sas were running that route a very economical aircraft and very reliable aircraft as well so uh, the fokker aircraft company's got a fantastic history um sadly though uh, it's had a lot of financial problems problems in the past but uh, it must make the the dutch very proud to have such a uh, a great manufacturer uh, of products and very often they used uh, rolls royce engines on on most of their products as well certainly in the last uh, 20 years or so 
I must admit, I like the list of notable fuckers. There are some great fuckers there. <laughs> Have you seen that one on the bottom of the, the article? I didn't. Oh, dear. A, it says, uh, uh, let me read out the notable fuckers then. Uh, it says the Fokker EI or E1 was the first aircraft to be armed with a synchronized machine, machine gun that fired through the propeller. I think it means through the propeller arc. If you fire through the propeller, you're probably going to do it a bit of damage. <laughs> yeah. And help the Kaiser achieve air supremacy in the First World War during an episode known as the Fokker Scourge. And mm. anyone else going to read one? <laughs> the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, is closely associated with a Red Fokker, the DR-1 triplane, the engine of which is on display at the Imperial War Museum. You see, we got it because we shot him down. <laughs> yes, and it says, also says, such was the popularity and success of the Fokker DV-2 uh, for the Germans in the First World War. The Allies demanded their surrender when the Kaiser capitulated. A dv Two is on display at the RF Museum in Hendon in, in London. There you go. I, I like the one about Amelia Earhart. She was closely associated with the Fokker. <laughs> <laughs> she completed... Uh, she, she became the first woman to fly across the Atlantic as a passenger in a Fokker. There you go. Fok yeah, uh, Fokker F7, uh, I guess that is. F-V-I-I. Uh, Lane Street in the chat room has said that his very first airplane ride was on a Fokker 27. Mm. That's the Fokker Friendship, wasn't it? Mm. Yes. Yeah. So moving on then uh, to uh, the next story, Nev, and uh, uh, this is uh, quite an interesting one. I'm going I'm to try and attempt to play the video while uh, Nev's doing the story because uh, I watched this video earlier on in the week on YouTube and um, Nick, I can't wait for your comments on this uh, story. So uh, over to you, Nev. This is on the avgeekery.com and it's all about the Emirates A380 jet uh, doing a landing at Dusseldorf. And um, it says uh, landing a heavy or supersized airliner in strong crosswinds requires great skill. It's even more challenging in gusty conditions. In this video posted on YouTube by Cargo Spotter, the Emirates A380 airliner touched down hard while still crabbed during gusty crosswinds at Dusseldorf Airport in Germany. The jumbo then overcorrected as the pilot attempted to kick rudder to straighten out the jet after the hard landing. The jet then slid sideways before the pilot re finally regained control. Uh, the landing gear incurred some serious side loads on that landing and the gusty winds uh, cause areas of rapid lift and downdrafts and strong wind uh, gradients near the surface also lead to low level wind shear. If a wind gust subsides at the wrong moment the aircraft can sink faster leading to a rough landing or worse there are many techniques that pilots use in stormy and gusty conditions and many crews discuss how they are spring loaded to go around with an unusually high sink rate or if they encounter wind shear and uh, they also brief a reference ground speed. This speed accounts for the expected shear. It means that an aircraft will fly faster so that it can fly through the shear and still be on speed at touchdown. Now, uh, the uh, runway that it was landing on at um, Dusseldorf, not quite sure which one it was, but the longest runway is less than 10,000 feet long. So, again, um, if you're fairly heavy, you want to try and, you know, stick it down uh, fairly close to the numbers but um i think nick will have a view on this there's there's a lot of um what we what they call uh, pilot, pilot induced oscillation here isn't there? <laughs> well yeah. um to be fair uh the uh, if the 380 is similar to the 340 600 um in a very strong crosswind you're actually uh, the technique is only to have kicked off half the drift uh, by the time the wheels touch down. Um, so you don't actually have to physically fully align the fuselage with the runway. I mean, there's nothing to stop you, but uh, uh, in a really strong wind, when you've got that amount to move the nose around the horizon and, and get the aircraft straight, uh, there is no need because uh, as you put an aircraft down, with, with it coming straight, it will continue to straighten as the wheels uh, uh, 
do their first touchdown. And they, there's not a lot of friction uh, from those wheels when they first touch the runway, so it's quite acceptable. There's no great side load if uh, if you're still straightening the airplane. And it also it makes it a lot simpler because, as we're probably aware, those of us who fly, when you kick off a lot of drift uh, in a crosswind landing, um, you've got a wing that's advancing and a wing that's retreating. So in this case, his uh, right wing was advancing and his left wing was retreating. That means that right wing is going to get slightly more lift because it's uh, got a slight increase in airspeed. And um, it uh, has slightly greater angle of attack compared with the retreating wing, which means the aircraft will tend to roll. Uh, in this case, it would have rolled left. Um, and if the wheels are sort of... Uh, on the ground at that point, then it will resist that. You won't have to put so many control inputs in. Now, I think uh, the analysis is quite reasonable. The guy was a little late in uh, in decrabbing, as it's referred to by some people, when you straighten the aircraft out. Uh, so he says, kick the rudder. We don't. We, we feed the rudder in uh, and watch the effect. Now, it looks like the pilot was doing this a little bit mechanically, and he, by the look of the rudder deflection he almost got to full rudder deflection and he got there quite late so by the time he got there the aircraft was almost straight uh so he was late in taking it off so the aircraft um went well past the point at which he should have had the rudder central again um and then of course he had the problem of uh, getting the nose back the other way again and you're right uh, maybe he ended up in a little bit of pilot induced oscillation where he was a bit out of phase with what the aircraft was doing uh, and it took him a couple of oscillations to get it straight it looked a bit ugly it wasn't unsafe but um, uh, hugely unsafe but it would have needed a quite fair amount of maintenance inspection I think just to make I sure guess the, the other thing is uh, as well is to uh, presumably to, to get the wheels on the deck uh, firmly so that you do get the spoilers the auto spoilers to, to spin up as quickly as possible to, to, ki to kill the lift so you've got effective braking I, I guess yeah, the, well, the last thing you want to do is overflare in a, in a strong crosswind because if you, as soon as you start to straighten the aircraft, the airplane is going to start to slide off the side of the runway, you know, obviously because of the crosswind. Once you straighten the airplane, it's now going to make the airplane drift. Um, so we line up on the upwind side of the runway. It doesn't look like he did much of that. Uh, and then when we straighten the airplane and uh, get the wheels on the ground, it won't drift anymore. If you overflare, then the airplane will start to drift towards the downwind side of the runway and you can run out of the runway width before you get yourself settled on. And that can be a bit ugly. Um, so uh, it, it wasn't a perfectly flown approach. But then again, I mean, uh, there's absolutely nothing uh, to stop airlines putting um, young cadets on these uh, aircraft. Uh, so it may not have been an experienced pilot that was doing it, uh, although most of the younger pilots have got quite um, restricted crosswind limits. So they, the captain usually takes a, an approach with a particularly high crosswind. But, you know, not everyone can do it every time perfectly. Mm. So Richard yeah. King in the chat room, Nick, has said, would the pilot be invited for tea and biscuits with the chief pilot? I doubt it. Um, Airbus have a system, though, where they, uh, well, certainly for our airline, they download uh, what is the equivalent of uh, the air data recorder. Uh, they download it after every flight. And uh, so they have all the data that would be there for all the control inputs, all the, you know, systems, all the... Uh, the parameters of the aircraft available and our airline runs it through a, a computer program which then puts it up on a screen and you can see uh, a simulation of the aircraft and what the pilot was doing with his controls and what the aircraft was doing and um, our system is not a one that uh, blames pilots it will de-identify the actual pilot involved um, but a guardian, now he's a sort of pilot's friend, will know who it is. And uh, if he says, look, we've had, you know, the, the system has thrown up this landing as being a bit awful. Um, as your friend, would, would you like to pop in and have a couple of goes in the sim just to settle yourself down and make sure you're completely happy with the techniques? Um, or would you like to raise an safety report? He might have done both of these things. Um, uh, in which case, uh, 
it's usually uh, you know there's no no fault we we all need as much training as we can get uh, he was probably invited into the simulator for a couple of goes just to make sure he's got the technique right and uh, if there was something uh, that distracted him on this particular landing then it'll be uh, you know there'll be no fault at his uh, so uh, we usually treat these things like adults there's there's no huge slap because otherwise the next bloke to have a problem will uh, try and hide the fact so we're all very open and honest about it uh, and we uh, just accept what training we might need, retraining we might need, uh, before we go and do another one. A few of the questions I've been asked, actually, Nick, through the people I work with who've seen this video, uh, said that how would the people in the back of the aircraft have, have felt in uh, in you know on that situation? Because if you do watch the video, it does look like they're being <laughs> thrown around quite a bit there. Yeah, well, the guy, the guys in the cockpit would be the same. I mean, uh, the aircraft rotates around its center of gravity, which is pretty much halfway down, you know, on average, halfway down the cabin. So the guys in the uh, the cabin crew in the tail and the guys at the front would have felt similar side forces. Um, normally, it's not too bad on a really long aircraft like the 380 and like the 340-600. Those side forces can build up, and it can feel a little uncomfortable when you uh, you might be, you know. Uh, be pushed out of your seat a little bit to the side if you're holding a cup of tea you might have spilt it so i suspect uh probably not best to be holding a hot drink during one of these landings so moving on then to the last story uh nick and uh it's uh, it's another airbus one for you oh good lord and it's on track to fly its electric aerial taxi in 2018 uh, Airbus is looking to put its flying taxi in the air, confirmed City Airbus Chief Engineer Marius Beb Bebesel this week. The schedule is uh, on track after City Airbus conducted successful ground tests of the electric power system it's using to propel the vehicle through the air. And you'll be able to see uh, the picture, I'm sure. It looks like a drone with a little cabin hung underneath. So... I guess somewhere between a uh, a four ducted propped helicopter and a drone. It looks rather smart, quite honestly. So it's a vertical takeoff and landing craft that uses four a four rotor design, and uh, that would be capable of taking up to four passengers on short flights in dense urban areas. Well, I'm sure it could actually operate in area any areas it doesn't have to be dense urban areas, but I suspect that's where they'll deploy it, uh, with the aim of connecting major transportation hubs, including rail, train stations, sorry, and airports. It's designed to be pilot operated at launch but to eventually transition to be a fully autonomous vehicle uh is that because the pilot has to jump out or what i don't know oh sorry once the tech catches up yeah all right fair enough um cnbc who wrote this uh, reports that airbus is aiming to operate the aircraft along fixed predetermined routes with top air speeds of around 80 miles an hour they'll be able to skip over the traffic that can dramatically increase travel times, entering and exiting busy city transit points, which would theoretically also help alleviate ground congestion. Short hop flights are also an ideal application of battery electric tech, since that's all that the vehicle will be able to manage using fully electric power sources in the near term plus battery unit swapping or autonomous docking charging could help make it easier to make these vehicles fully self-flying in the future well i've got a a lawnmower that uh is a ro battery powered robot and it mows my lawn very well so i guess this is like one of those upside down you've, you've got that <laughs> you've got a robot lawnmower nick well, yeah, I call her my wife, but no, I'm only oh. joking. Yes, I do have a little robot lawnmower that's <laughs> probably, um, yeah, she came from Stepford, my wife, nice girl. Um, so <laughs> she, it's probably buzzing around the, the, the garden now. In fact, let me have a quick look at my app. Uh, let's, let me just see. Uh, I'll be, be right with you. Home... Uh, Nev, have you got one, these, um, Nev, got one of these? Nev, got one of these robot uh, it's lawnmowers? Si it's sitting no, charging... Um, <laughs> but it's fully charged now, actually, almost. So I'm going to set it off, start mowing, leaving home. There it goes. It's off. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm now going to mow my lawn. So <laughs> don't you think it's rather apt, though, that the uh, this flying um, taxi is going to be made by Airbus? 
Ah, oh, oh, see what he did well, there. Oh, yeah. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's why they thought of the name, don't you? Could possibly be why. Yeah. <laughs> but it, possibly. Looks, it looks like a great design. I mean, if they're intended on having this in the air by 2018, I mean, that's only next year. I mean, we're nearly in 2018 now. It'll soon be Christmas at this rate. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, the technology is all there, really. You've really got to make it safe enough to uh, carry passengers, carry people in it. Um, and I've no doubt that it will be highly automated. So I reckon the pilot's probably going to sit there and do absolutely nothing and just watch it. And as soon as they can get it uh, cleared and it's done sufficient flights with a pilot there twiddling his thumbs and picking his nose, then um, they will allow it to go without him. Because after all, if any carries four, you don't really want 25% of the load taken up by some useless pilot. <laughs> you heard it first here. So uh, I know. So that is where we bring mm. the commercial news segment to a close. Uh, we've got uh, a segment from Nev coming up in a bit. We've also got uh, a little bit of military news this week. I thought, uh, being as we have Nick on the show, we better have some military news mm. this week. Uh, we've also got a segment set, uh, sent in today as well from uh, Pilot Pip. And uh, yeah, so uh, Nev, I think it's uh, over for you, uh, to you to introduce uh, this week's segment. Yeah, I spend a lot of time at Heathrow Airport, as you might know, and uh, Terminal 5 is normally my, my terminal of choice. And um, so I, when I was there a few weeks ago, uh, I bumped into one of my industry colleagues, uh, Luke, and we had a good chat about uh, all of his all the flying that he does all around the world. So uh, here we go. Hello everyone and welcome to another NEV's Passenger Experience segment. Well, this week I'm at Terminal 5 at London's Heathrow Airport, speaking with an industry colleague of mine, Luke Marlerhausen. T5 is the British Airways terminal at Heathrow, but just for a change, we decided not to have a go at poor old BA, who have come in for enough stick in this series, I think. And also, we didn't want to get thrown out of the terminal. Instead, we spoke about the long-haul flying that Luke has done over the years and about the amenities at the airport and on the aircraft. I began by asking him which carriers he prefers to fly with on these long sectors. So, you know, I, I really prefer using someone like Emirates or Qantas um, purely on the, uh, on the quality of planes and, and the yeah. service that you would get from, from someone like that. Um, you, you're long in the tooth enough to know that, you know, certain, certain carriers, certain countries got certain prices but there's nothing beats actually arriving in the country fresh relaxed mm. and being able to function that day yeah which is more important to me than just uh you know a seat upgrade or something like that I, it's it's can i actually function at the other end mm. if, if i'm dead for a uh, a day yeah that's that's no and use also to if me. your company expects you to work the moment you get off the plane that's the other thing, absolutely yeah. i mean uh, I, i've been uh, we, we all get that sort of jet lag when you sort of do the Hong Kong or, or the uh, Sydney trip. Yeah. But it's like, you know, you get into Sydney at six o'clock in the morning, you've got to function for a few hours, yes. you know, not. And, and I have had this where you've had such an uncomfortable flight. Yeah. You actually collapse in the hotel at six o'clock. You know, you have your shower and you think, oh, I'm just going to sit down on the bed for a minute. Yeah. And then at 6 p.m. then you're like, oh, <laughs> yes. oh, no. <laughs> and then you have to power through the next day. And it actually yeah. doesn't just knock out a day. It knocks yeah. out two days yeah. because you spend a day recovering. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I really try and choose my airlines about you know what the actual onboard experience mm. is, the ambience, the pressure. Yeah. Um, so actually, is is the air aircraft important to you as well? Not not just the carrier. Hu hugely important. I mean, yeah. the first thing that I'll look at is is it a decent carrier? Am I going to get um, without wishing to string loads of screaming kids and and yeah. whatever jumping up and down? You know, I, I don't want that on the flight. I hear you. But it's, yep. it's, it's about the plane. That, yeah. that altitude, the 787, the 350, mm. the 380, yeah. make a huge amount of difference. Yeah. You, if you go from that to a 777 or a 767 and the noise and, and, and the tiredness, you know, yeah. just going locally, you know, from Stockholm to Heathrow or something, yeah. you know, can be a killer. You, you're asleep within an hour. Mm. It's, 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 it's so much noise yeah. and droning on. Whereas, you know, you can actually, you find you can function the other end. And, 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 and that makes, you know, makes it a more pleasurable experience than mm. something that's quite yeah. tedious and boring. Well, yeah. And here we are in Terminal 5 at Heathrow, which we have both been through, I don't know how many hundreds of times <laughs> in our life. And when we get through security, we normally go into a lounge somewhere. Yep. So, again, is that important to you before you start the flight? It's important to have somewhere that I can go and relax and, and sit down in. 
Um, I, I think that you find that different lounges are, uh, are at different standards. Um, you know, I've been to some fantastic lounges using the Priority Pass. Um, and sometimes, you know, you've got the option of using the business lounge mm. or a Priority Pass lounge. And, and sometimes a Priority Pass lounge is, is that much better. Yeah. But I'm not going in the lounges to go and get drunk. I, I, I see lots of people sort of online going for, you know, oh, they've got this champagne here and things yeah. like that and this wine. You know, I, I, I'm nine times out of ten, I've got to drive or do something the other end or I'm mm. going to a business meeting. Yeah. I can't afford to have that cloudiness in my head. Yeah. I'm already cloudy from, from the travel. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of really important to me that, you know, you get some decent food. And, and by that, I don't mean something really basic like a noodles or a, uh, <laughs> yes. a cling film wrap sandwich. Um, you know, I, I, love, I love the BA bacon sarnies. Mm. Fantastic. Yep. But I'm not bothered about a first class lounge, mm. you know, a club lounge. As long as I can get some space some peace and quiet, yeah. um, some Wi-Fi and can work. That's that's you know more important to me than yeah. than anything else. Have you noticed as well that <clears throat> here we are in T5 as I mentioned, and the new Terminal Two obviously has been recently opened as well, and the whole volume of the place is a lot quieter than previous terminal designs. Uh, and I, I would say it's a big improvement even before you start the, the check-in process. Oh, it's, it's a huge it's a huge improvement. I mean, you just walk through there, and you're not as stressed. And with the noise, the the, the sort of um, everything rushing around, you don't feel under that pressure. Straight straight from uh, walking in through the entrance with that nice open air bridge over to the terminal yeah. make, makes a huge amount of difference there. Um, you know, you compare that to somewhere uh, like Mumbai or something like that where mm. it's just absolute hell. You know, you've got yeah. security lines and... Uh, it's like a zoo, isn't it? And, and, and <laughs> AK-47s everywhere and... and uh, but that being said, when, when you're doing the business class through mm. somewhere like Mumbai, yeah. you, you've got that person walking you through and, 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 and there are rules for one people and rules for another. And it makes, actually does make a huge amount of difference. Yeah. It gives me a lot of security knowing that there's that much security there. But it also gives me, uh, I, I like the fact that, you know, we can go through and, and, and have a, a much better experience. Albeit, once you get in, the experience isn't great yeah. in my uh, in my experience. But uh, obviously, doing this this, this long haul stuff, are you prepared to pay the premium price uh, yourself for business class sectors and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, I, I, I almost think that if you want to do something, unless you're really, I need to be there, come what may, you have to go at the very least premium economy, and and, and I will pay to go the business. Um, you know, even if it's on a personal holidays. Uh, trips like that abroad, um, you know, I make the effort to go business class, mm. um, even if it means stopping through somewhere, um, because it's, you know, it's, it's about enjoying the time there. The travel mm. time is that time that you have to do come what may, um, and that experience it really s sets off the business trip or yeah. sets off the holiday. Yeah. Um, I, I remember uh, we were speaking about a trip to America. Um, I did a couple of months ago mm. where I actually flew from my local airport which meant I could check in within 20 minutes a nice lounge straight onto the plane and you check your bag all the all way, way through, all to, way the through to America oh, great. Um, that, that made a huge difference to me yeah. you know it meant that I could stay at home that bit longer yeah. um, you know I was premium uh, economy so I could I could get the you know I could get the lounges and mm. I could I could get the the extra space the extra leg room yeah. for me I'm you know I'm, I'm not a small fella so that that <laughs> that arm space that that shoulder space makes yeah. makes difference you know the economy seats everyone's got their advertised but it's never what is advertised yeah. um, and and it's you know you feel awfully conscious when you know you're sort of Holding, having to try and eat your meal with, with your sh elbows pinned into it's your side. It's not great, is it? <laughs> it just doesn't work. And from a business point of view, I mean, obviously lots of different companies have different travel policies, but I've noticed that a lot of companies are saying, well, we can, we, you're only traveling economy, almost regardless of the routes. I think that's just a false economy because you're not getting the best out of your employee under those circumstances. I'm not saying for one minute that everybody should be traveling business, but I think a sensible approach has got to be taken. I just wonder what your thoughts were about that. Yeah, I, I think it's, you're exactly right. It's about being sensible. Um, you know, if it's a last-minute deal um, and you have to be somewhere, then there is, you know, there's justifications. If, if a flight's a thousand bucks versus fifteen hundred bucks, then there's an argument to, you know, well, that, let's make sure that we can get there fresh and alight. If it's five thousand bucks to a thousand bucks, then 
you can understand the, the company's economic argument there. Yeah. Um, but in terms of actually present, usually these deals where you're going long distance is for a very important reason. And if you're there jaded, you might as well not be there at all. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, in, in the same way that if you've got an early morning meeting somewhere, you'll often have a hotel the night before so that, you, you know, you make sure you're at the appointment on time, prepared, smart, crisp, fresh. You know, you can't do that if you're flying economy and, and you know, you've just been sat with your yeah. elbows by your side. To the degree that, you know, I think all companies should do that. Mm. Do they do it? No. A, a lot of companies now are coming around to the reasoning that, you know what, actually it does make a difference to how the pitches are presented mm. um, and winning that business. Because at the end of the day, we're there to make money for the company. And, and if that return on that investment is there, then why would you not do something along those yes. lines? Exactly. So have you got any other uh, long haul trips coming up uh, later this year or, or next year at all? Anything in the diary? Yeah, um, I'm off in about two weeks time. Okay. <laughs> off over to Barbados and then Las Vegas. Oh, very nice too. Um, taking my wife over there. So I've, I've uh, got, got a mixture of airlines going on that one. So I'm, I'm flying over uh, to through New York to see some old buddies. So I'm uh, doing United, hop over to there. And then taking American down to Barbados yep. through Miami. Um, and then back over to um, Las Vegas um, from Barbados. Oh, um, nice. And then stopping off in Denver, Chicago, and then back home. So it's, it's a little bit of a road trip, but it's uh, a road trip with a plan. My, my wife's never seen some of these airports. So some of these airports are quite iconic when you're flying into yeah. them. You don't really need to stop in the town to see them. So somewhere like Denver where you've got the Rockies, uh, you know, it, to spend a few hours there looking at that, that's an amazing sight and experience. Um, the same for Chicago, you know, flying over the lake, coming over the city. Um, so there's lots of nice things to enjoy um, on, the, on the route around. What do you think about... Um if we sort of fast forward 10 years, what other things do you think the airlines will be offering on board? We're, we're seeing a lot more, obviously, in-flight entertainment and, and more bring-your-own-device stuff going on as well, I've noticed uh, yeah. recently. Do you think we're going to see more of that? I think you have to. I mean, I, I would say that I very rarely use the in-flight entertainment nowadays. Mm. Um, you know, more important to me is, is things like the Internet. I, I, you know, I do not want to be able to take phone calls in, in an air airplane. Um, and I appreciate those airlines that stop people make, taking uh, calls there because I think it's that downtime where you can actually think. Yeah. You can put some music on, and, but you can still answer emails, be working, be productive in that mm. time, you know, especially if the company was wise enough to put you in a business class so you've got that table, you've got that space to be able to work. I, I like the sort of things that you see from people like Virgin America, JetBlue, where you've got, you know, you've got the back uh, touchscreens in the back, for ordering a service so you know I, I if often if I'm flying again I don't want a three course meal mm. you yeah. know I'm, I'm quite happy with a sandwich thank you very much if I could just ask for a sandwich yes or a drink or some okay. nuts whilst you know whilst I'm working yeah. via a simple touch screen rather yeah. than have to press my call button and things like that that's that's much more interesting to me I think you're gonna get a lot more data I like the live TV um, so I, I think United American have all got those um, on there, certainly in their US domestic flights, um, because it's it's something that's relevant that you can keep your eye on. You know, for me, I like to keep an eye on the rugby or the football or something yeah. like that, uh, or s soccer for your Americans. <laughs> um, but it makes a lot of difference. Or if there's something going on that's newsworthy, mm. I can keep an eye on it. What's going on there? Yeah. Um, I guess I can track it online, but it's. Um, I think that's the way of the future. And, and uh, surely it's got to be better for the airlines as well because it means they can reduce the amount of weight they have to have on planes for all the hard drives and yeah. what have you. I think you're always going to have that screen there. I, I, I wonder how long it will take them to commercialise that um, and, and so you can sort of, you know, gamble for real on an airline. Mm. You know, imagine that captive audience there with a oh credit gosh, card. Yeah. <laughs> and boredom <laughs> so <laughs> well that's really interesting well great to see you again Luke and thanks very much for talking to me today no problem no problem good we'll see you now find this and other great shows at the Aviation Media Network the voices in your head dot com
The Plane Talking UK podcast is a voluntary project that aims to keep you informed with the latest aviation-related stories from news buyers across the globe. Producing our content does cost money, though. If you enjoy our show, why not help us keep on the air by making a donation towards the server and website hosting fees through PayPal. Any contributions would be greatly appreciated. Are you an Amazon user? If so, why not do your shopping through the link on our website? There's no cost to yourself, and Amazon pay us a small referral fee on qualifying purchases. To find out more about the show and to meet the team, take yourself to our website www.plaintalkinguk.com or find us on facebook at facebook.com forward slash plain talking uk on twitter via at plain talking uk or get in touch via email on podcast at plain talking thanks, thanks for, for listening. listening flyby 5823 trent dane for 23 hour manchester with air 6x client flight level 210 direct to britman's park United 123, maintain 280 knots. ever wondered what it would be like to fly a commercial passenger jet? Looked up at the sky and thought, I wish that was me? Well now anyone has the chance to have a go at flying in a real aircraft simulator. NP Simulations and Flight Experience London, the only official Boeing licensed product of its kind in the UK, offer you the chance to fly anywhere in the world in their fixed base Boeing 737-800 flight simulator. And that's not all. Ground School London offers many different courses for the up-and-coming pilot looking for a start in aviation. With prices starting at just £109, the sky's the limit. So for the ultimate flight simulator experience or engaging preparatory courses, including those for schools and colleges, check Check out the websites at www.london.flightexperience.co.uk and www.groundschoollondon.com or call on 020 300 40 616. NP Simulations. Fly your dreams. And we're back. We are. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Oh, thank you for that, Nev. That was absolutely amazing, as always. Uh, yeah, very... gra- glad you like it. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. eloquent chap you found there. Yes, been a good uh, mate of mine in the air industry f- for many years, but yes, he's always doing lots of flying everywhere. And uh, yeah, another good one coming up next week with a chap called Nick Purnell. And uh, Nick is a bit of a media guru, and he's uh, I bumped into him in uh, Soho in the West End of London, uh, which is the heart of the media city, uh, or certainly is down south anyway in the UK. The and, heart uh, of various other occupations uh, as well. Moving on quickly. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> Yes, but uh, no, so that should be another good one uh, next week. Excellent. Looking forward to that very muchly indeed. So we have got some uh, military news uh, to bring you this week, just for a change, because we haven't had any for ages, and uh, we know that uh, Jonathan Warner loves to have a bit of military news. So uh, if everyone's ready, we're going to do some military news. So are we all ready? We are. Off we go. You bet. So kicking off this week's first news story then in the military news segment, it's on the businessinsider.com. And, uh, well, the uh, the story is uh, that's an interesting one indeed. The headline is, an Iranian fighter jet did what it looked or did what looked like a uh, Top Gun style move, uh, which was caught on camera. Uh, the, head, the story then, we don't know where... Uh, the uh, footage was filmed, um, or the still footage, reportedly shot from an Iranian phantom uh, from the weapons systems officer, uh, which seems genuine. It allegedly shows a U.S. Navy F.A. 18 Super Hornet shadowed by an IRIAF or Exa- Islamic Republic of Iran Air Force F-4E Phantom during a close encounter 
uh, occurred somewhere over the Middle East. The clip shows the American multi-role aircraft starting a left turn in the Iranian F-4, performing a displacement roll, most probably to keep the Super Hornet in sight, a maneuver that vaguely reminds the one uh, of the one performed in a famous scene in the film Top Gun. According to uh, some sources, uh, the rear cockpit of the aircraft uh, filming the Rhino, uh, as the Super Hornet is dubbed in the U.S. Navy. Uh, yes, the F-4 was nicknamed Rhino because of its aggressive look, but the Super Bug community stole it. it. appears to be too large for a Phantom, suggesting it might be an F-14 Tomcat. Close encounters are in international airspace of Iran, as well as over Iraq and Syria, where the Iranian F-4s have operated occur quite frequently. Uh, some funny antidotes have emerged uh, following these intercepts. There in 2012, uh, two Sukhoi Su-25 jets of the IRGC, the Army of the Guardians of the Islamic Revolution, attempted to shoot down an American MQ-1 flying a routine surveillance flight in international airspace some 16 miles off Iran. Although the interception of the unmanned aircraft failed, the Pentagon decided to escort the drones involved in ISR intelligence uh, reconnaissance missions with fighter jets, F-18 Hornets from aircraft carriers operating the in the uh, U.S. Fifth Fleet. Um, a few months later, in March 2013, the flight of two IRIAF F-4s attempted to intercept a U.S. MQ-1 drone flying in international airspace off Iran, and one of two Phantom jets came within about 60 miles from the UAV, but broke off pursuit after an F-22 Raptor providing... Uh, uh, HVAAE, or High Value Air Asset Escort, flew under the F-4 to check out the weapons load without them knowing that it was there, and then pulled up on their left wing and then called them and said, you really ought to go home. So most of the time, such close encounters are uneventful. However, early this year, a Syrian Su-22 fitter was shot down by U.S. Navy F-A-18E, belonging to the VFA-87 Golden Warriors and piloted by Lieutenant Commander Michael Mob, or M-O-B, Tremel, uh, 40 kilometers to the southwest of Raqqa, Syria. The Syrian jet had just conducted an airstrike on the anti-regime Syrian Democratic Forces, or SDF, aligned with the US-led coalition. Anyway, take a uh, look at the clip. I've got a clip here which I also will play in just a second um, while we're talking. So uh, you're, you're the guy to ask about phantoms, uh, Nick. Um, so uh, what do you think of this? Seeing the clip, unfortunately, it's not available on uh, my feed, but uh, there you go. So I'm just going to have to wait for you to bring it up, and I might watch it on yours. The um, the Phantom is going to be pretty damned old by now, uh, and uh, well, compared with um, an F-18 uh, Super Hornet, it's uh, it's well outgunned. Uh, it could be outmaneuvered very easily. I'm pretty sure the guys probably knew it was there and didn't consider it a threat. I suspect that uh, if this chap had one uh, Hornet there, the other one or several others were probably sitting behind him and he might not even have known they were there. Um, so, yeah, um, you can off run off and uh, see these uh, or get these mix-ups in international airspace. It's common. It is a Hornet. Um, yeah, it's quite common to uh, to mix up with other aircraft, uh, and there's often a bit of uh, playing around. Uh, we used to, uh, uh, flying out of uh, Cyprus, used to mix it with uh, um, Greek and sometimes Israeli uh, fighters out over the Mediterranean, international airspace. Um, and, uh, you know, you're always just a little bit tense particularly when you start manoeuvring. But if it's, uh, if it's obvious that the guy's not being too aggressive, uh, then uh, we usually treat it the way it is, just a couple of guys uh, just messing about. Um, but you always keep a very uh, realistic attitude towards what happens if he puts his nose on too much, locks his radar up or does something particularly aggressive, you might uh, uh, think again. But uh, there's nothing to stop him doing any of that stuff in international airspace. You can't shoot him down for doing it. You can only shoot him down if he uh, does something aggressive. So he, he really needs to fire a weapon for that to be uh, considered aggressive. Of course, uh, the one they should, the SU uh, they shot down 
Uh, that was obviously uh, had already performed an act of aggression, so it was a fair target. So moving on to the next story, and uh, Nev, this one's for you then. Yeah, which one do you want me to take, uh, Carlos? Uh, the, uh, uh, yes, I got the mix round, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> That's my fault. Um, I'll take the number one spot there. Uh, about the RF uh, typhoons. That's it, yeah. Yes. Well, this is uh, from the RF website themselves. And um, it says that the RF typhoons roll up the magic carpet in Oman and nearly 250 personnel comprising RF regular reserve and civilian contractors serving alongside the Royal Air Force of Oman have come together on exercise magic carpet 17. The detachment commander, wing commander Billy Cooper, said in two weeks of flying, we have flown 102 sorties. The typhoons have performed exceptionally well with first-class maintenance from our engineers. He added, not only have my pilots been able to practice all the skills they need, but it's been a fantastic opportunity to work in testing conditions for everyone from our field caterers to armourers and the forward air controllers who call in air power. The RAF has been hosted by the Royal Air Force of Oman, who have provided extensive training facilities. And Wing Commander Cooper said, from the military perspective, we have had excellent access to ranges to drop precision guided bombs and to use Typhoon's 27mm cannon, as well as practicing air defense alongside the RAFO F-16 jets, he added. But for me, and I know I can speak for the whole detachment, I particularly enjoyed the opportunity to meet our hosts, experience the professionalism of RAFO, and see what Oman has to offer. Being an, an Oman has provided um, training representative of, of the weather and flying conditions experienced on operations. The two weeks of flying have also enabled many personnel in the air and on the ground to be efficiently qualified in delivering live musicians. But as always with these things, it's not just about the pilots, it's about the support crews, the ground crews and all the logistics. So there's a, a lot more people involved uh, than just the guys flying the aircraft, I guess. Spent a few years or spent a few years uh, going on holiday in uh, in Oman. I have to say, is is some of the uh, the landscape in Oman is absolutely fantastic, and uh, it is a very very dry and uh, and hot country uh, most of the time. So I'd imagine it's quite um, quite challenging to fly, but also quite a nice country to fly over. So yeah. fabulous terrain. Now the RAF has had long had a uh, very close relationship with uh, the Amani Air Force and uh, um, a lot of the well when I was in the Air Force it was um, relatively common for our guys to do um, de deployments uh, over there as and serve on their Air Force they had quite a large Jaguar force and they had strike masters as well and uh, a lot of our pilots actually flew for and in the Amani Air Force they loved it their rules over there were uh, very, in inverted commas, operational. They didn't really have um, a low flying limit. You could fly as low as you felt capable. Uh, and um, if you search YouTube for some uh, photographs of low fly paths uh, in Amman, you'll see some quite remarkable sights. There's quite a famous story of a, of a guy who was going on leave and he was driving away from his air base, and uh, his mate and a Jaguar knew he was uh, leaving that afternoon. So he'd hung around, and as he saw his car leaving, going down the long straight road, he decided he was going to beat it up. And uh, the chap saw him coming, so he got out of his car and got his camera ready, thinking, well, this will be a good uh, shot. And the bottom of the Jaguar has two ventral strakes. Uh, they're about I don't know, a couple of feet long. So uh, underneath the rudder, just to help its uh, lateral safety. And uh, this pilot was so low, he sliced the roof open with one of these strakes. So pretty good job his mate had got out to take a photograph. Actually, Lane Street just asked a question in the chat room. Where do you store a tuba on a typhoon? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, and uh, that, Mr. Warner said on the central pylon in place of the fuel tank. There we go. Uh, there you go. I, th I think you could probably stick it up an engine, couldn't you, and make a good <laughs> tune. <laughs> now, Nick, Nick, obviously you, you were in the Air Force for, for quite some time. You had quite a, a great, you know, an awesome career in the Air Force. Where were some of the best countries, do you think, in the world to fly uh, in, in, a, in a fighter jet? 
Well, you've just actually, uh, certainly uh, the bomber pukes used to love being an imam. This is one of them. Uh, the, they used to call it wadi bashing. They, they are uh, deep gorges in the uh, mountains of uh, Oman that uh, were several hundred feet deep and uh, very nice tight corners. And you could get right in there and dust the floor with sheer walls of rock uh, either side of you and go sweeping back and forward down these uh, waddies. And uh, that was some of the most testing and uh, I'm sure exhilarating flying. Uh, I used to love low flying over Scotland, absolutely beautiful. Some of the most fantastic landscapes uh, you'd ever imagine. Um, yeah, when you're uh, doing an air defense job, you're not often down in the weeds. Um, New Zealand, of course, was a superb uh, country to fly around. And when I was out there, I was doing ground attack most of my time uh, with 77 Squadron on the F-18. And uh, New Zealand, uh, just yeah, as you've seen from uh, the movies that... Uh, uh, you know, they, they made the Lord of the Rings movies. It's stunning landscape, absolutely stunning, but also great for their little A4s to hide in and come and bounce us. Uh, unfortunately, their fast jet air force or side of their air force was shut down a while ago. So do you want to take the last uh, story in a military segment then, Nick? It's a tanker story. Oh, you know what we used to call the tanker pilots? <laughs> uh, it reminds me of tanker, <coughs> begins with a W. Um... Family show, family show. Family show. So this is this is the KC forty six A and it's a KC forty six A refueling another KC forty six A. Um so this is a Boeing tanker refueling another Boeing tanker for the first time. Well, it's just because it's taken them so long to work out how to do it. I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, it took place during a four-hour flight in which the two aircraft refueled each other, Boeing said in a statement. Congratulations, chaps. The pair achieved a maximum offlay, offload rate of 1,200 gallons a minute. Actually, that's quite fast. <laughs> that's pretty quick. And transferred 38,100 pounds of fuel. Uh, the activity involved personnel from both Boeing and the U.S. Air Force. So I'm guessing this is a, a new tank. I don't, what's it based on? Anyone know? Because it's a bit new for me. Uh, 767, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Is it? Uh, oh, not that new, then. No. I was just going to ask you, actually, Nick, with, with those sort of fuel transfer rates of 1,200 gallons per minute uh, and transferring 38,100 pounds of fuel, what on earth does it do to the, the weight and balance of, of both aircraft? Well, it shouldn't do too much, quite honestly, because uh, if it's got a decent uh, um, fuel gallery, uh, it will be transferred and kept within the COG limits quite comfortably. Uh, certainly on a fighter, we never had any problems, uh, but, you know, because you, you get much bigger COG changes when you drop a weapon. Yeah. And mo most aircraft, um, you know, the whole uh, is to try and keep the weight of fuel around the center of gravity so as you use fuel up it doesn't change too much yeah um and i'm sure they've they've thought of that but i i guess if it if uh you know it if they were transferring it to the wrong tank it might get a little bit difficult and i'm i don't know of course it's probably not fly by wire so it's probably not clever enough to even trim itself i don't know about the seven six so yeah i guess you might have to do actually do some flying but of course what i'm looking at here is the usaf's probe and uh, not probe and drogue it's the um what do they call that stupid thing the flying uh, jet nozzle uh, you know they they have this very complicated boom uh, that they have to deploy and that a boom operator that was a great Sade song actually do you remember that <laughs> boom operator I'm a boom operator anyway um, they fly this boom out of the back of the aircraft uh, and it's controlled with a little pair of wings and it has a telescopic nozzle on the end of it and all the receiver does is kind of formate there and hope for the best and this boom operator, usually some big sergeant, he lined it up with a hole in the receiver aircraft and just plugs this big lump of metal in. And then once it's made contact, you kind of like join together. But you still got to stay relatively tight in formation because not a lot of play. Now, m the much simpler system uh, is, of course, the probe and drogue where the guy trails a hose with a 
a, uh, a basket on the end, and you pop your probe out and uh, help yourself to the basket. You plug it in, you get the fuel, um, which is a much simpler system, and you can refuel multiple fighters, for example, off the same tanker, because you can deploy one drogue off each wing, uh, and um, you know the, the rest of the world uses it, including the U.S. Navy, I might add. The U.S. Air Force is about the only air force uh, that uses this system of course except for those that have bought it but uh, there you go uh, i think once they started with this overcomplicated and expensive system they felt they're obliged to keep it up because it was going to cost too much to convert all their airplanes i was going to ask you nick did uh, in your time in the air force did you uh, do any air to air refueling yourself oh heaps more than i can uh, describe i even did some off one of these um uh boom systems um, because we fa worked out a way for us to refuel off the American tankers and what they did was they they attached at the end about a nine foot length of hose with a basket on it and a big knuckle joint where the boom joins on and um, you had to try and formate on this little titchy bit of hose make contact and then move up and left uh, and make the hose go into a nice S shape which considering only about had about nine feet of it were pretty tight formation uh, and then you hold it in very very steady position every time this damn thing banked of course this boom that's hanging down swings out can you imagine that because it's uh, when the aircraft banks it's got it's going to move a long way sideways and you had to try and formate on it as the guy banked and you if you if you uh, let it get too far out of position it used to rip the end of your probe off and you kind of lived home with this big big dangling luckily there was a bit of a loose uh what they a weak point on the probe so that it used to just pull the end of your probe off and just leave it there in the basket which used to hack everyone else off that was trying to take fuel because you know you blocked the basket no one else could make contact do you think there'll ever be a time nick when uh, they'll they'll make or produce or work out a system of air-to-air -air refueling for passenger aircraft? I think the uh, risk factor of getting two huge airplanes together in the same piece of sky is too great. Mm. And quite honestly, where do you want to go that you can't currently get to if you wanted to? Because, uh, you know, the 350-1000 is going to be able to go non-stop London to New Zealand almost certainly. As current aircraft could if they wanted to. There is plenty of aircrafts that could fly at least halfway around the world. Um, but they probably can't do it with a full passenger load. So they would have they have to uh, you know leave some cargo and leave some passengers at home and take on lots of fuel, which doesn't actually make it commercially viable. So I think the expense of putting up a tanker to feed a passenger aircraft uh, it would also be commercially uh, unworkable um, and just you know just not worth the bother. Oh. Any thoughts, uh, Nev? Before we move on. Yeah, I, as, as Nick says, I think the uh, the, the commercials of, of doing this, and also the um, yeah, it's still a relatively um, difficult operation air to air refueling, wh whichever way you look at it. And I think uh, trying to do it with a, a passenger aircraft with four hundred and fifty people on board is is probably not uh, not going to be the, the way forward. I don't think so. Um, I think we're going to start. Well, we're starting to see this. You know, uh, Qantas operating that that Perth to London service starting in March of next year. So we're seeing longer range stuff happening anyway as as the engines and the aerodynamics get better. So I think we're going to be seeing some uh, uh, some some more of that kind of flying. Actually, I, I note from the chat room actually that uh, people are reminding us that the new Air Force One yes. won't be capable of air to air refueling, which I find remarkable. Because yeah. I thought the whole point was to get a control center up with uh, the president, fly around for as long as you wanted to until it was safe to get him back down on the ground again. Of course, if you're not going to have him air to air refuel capable, you're, you're limited both in range and endurance. So uh, how does that work? But there you go. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So then we are going to uh, have a, another segment coming up uh, right now. This one was sent in to us by uh, the man that is Pilot Pip. He's, uh, he's got around to doing us another awesome segment. So that's coming up for you right now. Plane safety from the flight deck with Pilot Pip.
Hey everyone, it's Pip here coming at you from Columbus, Ohio in the good old US of A land. As some of you will know, I'm over here on a training course for a few weeks and I arrived last weekend having flown across with American Airlines, which is the first time for me with that particular airline. And it was also the first time for me flying on the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, or bin liner if you like. Uh, and that was all rather exciting, flying on a new airline and a new aircraft as well. And I was met in Columbus by the very lovely uh, Jen Niffa. She was there to meet me at the gate, and that was uh, a rather nice touch. So thank you, Jen, very much. But I thought I might uh, come up with a segment talking all about my experience on the new airline and on the new plane. And I thought I could call it something like um, Pip's Passenger Experience, which I think is a brilliant name. I don't know where I got it from. Don't ask me. It just came to me. Pip's Passenger Experience. So in this segment, I'm going to be talking to myself about the 787 and my experiences on American Airlines. So I began by asking myself about my general first impressions of the 787. Well, initially I was um, aiming to get a British Airways flight, which was operated on the 747. Uh, and it was a British Airways ticket, but I later found out it was going to be operated by American Airlines, which I thought, I didn't really want that. But then I saw it was going to be on a 787. So I thought, ah, oh, cool, that will be quite interesting. My first time. Always wanted to go on the 787. Uh, and now I'm on board. I've got to say, it's quite a nice aeroplane. First impressions getting on board very smart and slick. The American Airlines uh, colour scheme and upholstery is all very nice. This one's in a 333 configuration, so three one side, three in the other, and three in the middle. Now, it's an, an economy ticket that uh, they've booked me. Uh, it's out of my hands, it was booked by Safe Jets. So for training travel, unfortunately, it's just an economy ticket on long haul. It used to be business class, but not anymore. So uh, it's an economy ticket. But what I did, I tried to get an upgrade. I looked at the options for getting an upgrade. Uh, and actually, I couldn't do it because the ticket wasn't booked directly with British Airways, but rather via our own internal systems, which is effectively a travel agent. So I couldn't uh, upgrade myself. But I was able to get an extra legroom seat of sorts. Um, American Airlines have this quite a nice cabin setup. They've got something called um, Main Cabin Extra, I think they call it, which isn't quite premium economy, but it's not quite regular economy either. So I was able to pay for just, uh, I think I paid about £90 for it. I was able to get a seat in this Main Cabin Extra. So what I got for that basically is a, a, a 36 inch pitch seat instead of the regular 31 which uh, I think actually for 90 odd pounds was uh, thoroughly worth it. I've got plenty of legroom here, um, it's quite nice. Uh, looking at the economy seats, it's quite tight. 31 inches on an eight and a half hour flight, it's pretty tough to, uh, I think, to sit there. Um, so this is quite nice. The seat itself, it's quite stiff, it's very upright. Uh, it's not the most comfortable seat I've sat in actually, I must be honest. Uh, the, the, the headrest behind me here is uh, it's a little bit low down. I quite like it to be a, a little bit higher up and a little bit more substantial so I can kind of rest my head on it. Uh, I've tried using my inflatable pillow, but I'm, I'm finding I'm having to move around a lot. I'm constantly fidgeting, trying to get comfortable. Uh, the legroom is great. The 36-inch pitch is nice, uh, but it's not quite as nice as being able to stretch out fully. I can't quite do that. So I'm... Uh, I'm finding it tough to find a comfortable position actually. Uh, when I first got on I thought yeah it, it looked nice actually with all the the overhead bins down it was quite cramped they take up a lot of space and yeah they're pretty decent sized bins I suppose could be a bit bigger but actually once they're, they're all pushed up and stowed it actually becomes very roomy there's lots of headroom and with the 333 I think that gives enough space I know some people are operating the 787 uh, with four seats in the middle, which I think would make it really cramped. I'm not quite sure how they can get away with that. But this is pretty comfortable, I've got to say. It's not too bad. I'd heard a lot before about the, the mood lighting in the 787, and when we first got on, actually, I wasn't 
that impressed with it. It was very harsh, just like a white sort of uh, light that you get in an office building or something, you know? It wasn't great. But I've seen that they're able to, to change that so that it, uh, as we got underway, it changed to a nice sort of mellow blue lighting. Um, and now that we've taken off and we're up in the cruise, it's... Well, actually, I've got to say, it's kind of weird. They've Even though it's only about midday, local time, they've put the lights right down and they've made the cabin totally dark, which they're able to do with the rather funky windows. Uh, and I've got to say, that's probably one of my favourite features of the 787, is these huge windows. They're probably a good 30 or 40% bigger than regular windows that you'll get in an Airbus or a, any other uh, regular aircraft. There's great big windows, so even sitting in the aisle seat, uh, as I am, that's my preferred seating position is the aisle, the window is big enough that I can look across and get a pretty good view out the window. Or it would be, <laughs> except for the fact that they've dimmed all the windows, which they're able to do remotely and electronically. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how it works, but they can... Um, some sort of fancy electrical resistance system that they can dim the windows, like dimmed glass. So they've dimmed it all the way down, so it's almost pitch black in here, like it's night time. Which I find a bit puzzling, since this is a, clearly a daytime flight. We departed at uh, 8.30 or so in the morning, and we're flying throughout the afternoon. So why they felt the need to dim it all the way down, I don't know. A general facility sitting around the seat here. Uh, it's pretty good, actually. There's a, a nice power plug adapter, a proper three-pin uh, power plug, so I can plug in my iPad and my computer or anything else. That's really quite nice. Uh, there's also a, a couple of USB sockets in each seat that I can plug stuff into, so there's plenty of electrical charging options. I'm not going to run out of juice at any point. And the flat screen in the back of the seat is really nice. It's a nice big screen, um, touch screen, and it works beautifully. I've been on plenty of aircraft before where they're so finickety, you press the screen and it doesn't do what you expect it to do. But this one actually is really nice. It's almost like an iPad. You can, you can swipe through and have a look at all the, the different options. There's games, there's books, there's TV, and there's tons and tons of movies. So quite impressed by the IFE. Uh, and obviously that's an American Airlines choice rather than the, the aircraft itself. Uh, so that's nice. Plenty of movies to watch. I've already watched uh, a movie. I've watched The Martian. <laughs> I've seen it like six or seven times already, but uh, I love that movie. So I've watched that again, and no doubt I'm going to watch some more movies as well. Uh, what else? Oh, i tell you something I don't like is these the air vents. Uh, I quite like to be able to direct the flow of cold air. I'm a bit weird. I just like to have a constant stream of cool air over my face. And usually in your average Airbus 320, you've got the little louves that you can direct, you know, the little air vents. You can open them up and you can point them in the direction you want. But these ones are just fixed. You, they're either on or off. You can't direct the airflow, um, which is a little bit annoying. Uh, but, you know, still, it, it works pretty well. It's a nice, comfortable temperature. But I'd, I'd like the ability to be able to direct the air. A um, couple of other points I made a note of to talk about was the... Well, on startup. Uh, you know, it's always quite fun to sit on a new aircraft and listen to the, all the funny sounds and noises and little quirks that it has. And I've got to say, the engine startup on the 787 is quite bizarre. It's very loud. There's a real deep rumble, but not the sort of typical rumble you get off a jet engine. It's more like an old Ford Sierra starting up or a, a piston engine. It's, uh, I'm not quite sure what that is. A very odd noise. But it only lasted... Um, I don't know, 20 seconds or so, and only with the first engine as well, as that thing rumbled into life. But otherwise, apart from that, that was quite nice. And what about American Airlines itself? So the aircraft, all in all, I think is pretty good. Um, oh, the, the cabin altitude, that's something I've got to talk about. Um, so the cabin altitude on the 787, up at cruise altitude, so typically something in the high 30s, uh, the cabin altitude is down at around 6 thousand feet six six and a half thousand feet where typically on an airliner it's up at eight or eight and a half so far I'm not really noticing a big difference with that actually honestly I couldn't uh, tell the difference one thing I can tell the difference with is the the moisture there's I could definitely say without a doubt there is a lot more moisture content in the air it's much 
um, it's much more comfortable for breathing. That you know, typically the air on an airliner because it comes straight from the engines, it's bleed air direct from the engines. It's very dry, so you can really notice that after a long flight on an airliner, it's dry, dry air conditioned air. But not so on the uh, on the Dreamliner because the, the air is conditioned in a totally different way. I'm not an expert, but it's not coming directly off the engine bleed. Um, it's more. Um, I guess it's coming directly from the, the outside air, so it's, it's a lot uh, more moisture within that air, and you can really notice that, so that's quite nice. I'm liking the nice, moist, conditioned air. Uh, American Airlines themselves, yeah, not bad. I'm not sure what I was expecting. As I say, I was hoping to go with BA, which, you know, nothing special there, at least in economy. Um, one thing I, I was a little bit peed off with was that uh, this is a BA ticket, it was booked with British Airways, operated by American Airlines, and with BA you get two checked bags, two checked suitcases on the long haul flights. So uh, as it happens, I, I've got two cases but at the same time I've got one suitcase. I put one suitcase inside another uh, because I want to bring two suitcases back with me. Uh, so I was quite surprised then, having been told that I can take two suitcases uh, when turning up at Heathrow to check in to be told that the extra suitcase is uh, 70 or 80 pounds extra and I said no hang on BA give you two suitcases and they said yeah well but this is an American Airlines and they only let you have one case and I said yeah but it's a BA ticket and back and forth we went and the long and short of that is although it is a BA ticket it's an American Airlines flight therefore extra bags cost extra money so I'm kind of a bit peed off with that because on the way back, I do want to take two bags with me, but I don't want to pay the extra, so I'm going to have to email British Airways and see what they've got to say about that. So that was the first little minor hiccup of the day. But otherwise, American Airlines, yeah, it's been fine. Uh, up in the front, up in the business end of things, it all looks very comfortable. The seats look very nice. Uh, the food here in economy has <laughs> been pretty much what I expected. We got a, a sort of a hot breakfast. Um, tiny bit of scrambled egg and a sausage and uh, a little pot of orange juice you know the typical stuff you'd expect uh, I do have to congratulate American Airlines though this is quite an achievement for the absolute worst cup of tea ever served anywhere in the world it was revolting oh my god it was totally undrinkable this you know they've got a, a big pot of tea which has been stewed to death um, so <laughs> that was pretty bad I'm sure BA could have served a decent, or a better cup of tea at least. Um, but you know, so far so good. What I do like, I tell you, is the cabin announcements from the captain, from the cockpit crew. What drives me mad with British Airways, you get so many announcements. You get something from the captain, oh, welcome on board on behalf of uh, me and the first officer and the flight attendant Susie and her dog Dennis and her uncle and blah, blah, blah. And welcome to all our One World Club members and our Diamond Club this and our Platinum Club that and our partner airlines this. It's like, oh my God, get on with it. It goes on and on and on. And then, of course, it all gets repeated by the cabin attendants. Oh, and on behalf of the captain, we'd like to welcome you. With American Airlines, it was all very nice. It was very concise, no nonsense, straight to the point. Hi, I'm Captain Joe welcome aboard, we're going to Chicago, it's going to be this long, we're going to fly this high, see you later. Very professional, very nice, I quite like that. Well, I guess that's a, probably all I can think of to say right now. Um, on the flight back, it is a British Airways flight, uh, I think on a 777, actually. Uh, again, Columbus to Chicago, Chicago back to London. That's in uh, three and a half weeks from now. So maybe I'll do another segment then. Uh, but for now, I guess I'm going to hand it back to me. Okay, so that was Pip's passenger experience. I've got plenty of studying to be getting on with, so I'll leave you there. Hopefully, catch up with you in another segment very soon. Take care, everyone. And a big thank you uh, to Pip for that. Do you enjoy that, guys? We did, yes. Yeah, he sounds remarkably like someone else who just did a passenger experience, actually. <laughs> yes. I'm going to have to as long as, he, as long as he pays me a royalty, I don't mind. Ah, um, yeah, copyright. I don't know about that. Yes. He's always complaining, isn't he, Pip? Has he not ever had any, you know, decent flight in his life at all? 
<laughs> I, not that he would like to admit to. No, probably not. Should... Except if, if it was one of his, of course. Then oh, of course, be, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, well <laughs> Pip, is, Pip is very much like uh, young Nick here. They have the best seats on every flight they have. Mm. They do, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure Pip would think the best seat is probably in the left-hand side of the cockpit. <laughs> no. Far be it from me to say. He wouldn't want to steal your seat, Nick. <laughs> oh, well, he can have it in uh, 695 oh, days. Oh, you are actually, actually counting the days, Nick, until you, until you uh, leave that glorious, uh, glorious aircraft. Well, I'm not, but I have a, an app that is, and um, <laughs> it tells me that actually uh, today, being the 13th, Friday the 13th, I have, and I'm holding up to the camera, 695 days There left. you go. You saw it here first, guys and girls. Mm. 695 days. There you go. So that's 1.9 years, uh, 22.87 months, uh, 99.3 weeks. Uh, or if you want to go the other end of the scale, uh, 60,057,078 seconds. Oh, no, 76. Oh, no, 75, 74, 73 seconds to go. <laughs> there we go. So uh, that uh, is where we're going to start to wrap up the show now, I think, guys and girls. It's, uh, it's certainly been an eventful show, that's for sure. With, uh, oh, are, are a few we little, live? Few oh, I didn't realise, I'm sorry. Oh, but, <laughs> 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 so uh, before we uh, do start to wrap up things, Nick, uh, obviously we're going to promote the, uh, the awesome meetup that's happening soon at uh, Goodwood. So you, don't want to, you want to tell us uh, a bit about that? Uh, the, yes, there is a meetup at Goodwood. Now, I've heard that we're getting uh, a rogue um, broadcast pitching up on this meetup. So <laughs> I just want the APGers to form a circle and not talk to anyone that's not APG, all right? But it's going to be uh, at Goodwood Aerodrome, which uh, is in Sussex, uh, near the south coast-ish. Uh, and it's a lovely little aerodrome. They don't have a huge cafe, so but we're not there for the food and drink, are we? We're there to meet each other. We're going to have some guys flying in. Uh, it's being uh, really organized by Reuben Wells, but uh, it's simple enough. A pitch up at Goodwood Aerodrome at the Flying Club at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on... Sunday, the 29th of October. And uh, you'll find a whole bunch of like-minded people there sitting around, boasting, no, I mean, talking about flying and um, and just having a good time and drinking tea, coffee, beer. I'm sure they must have some beer. I know they got Beck's, not my favorite. But there you go. Um, but um, it's going to be a great time, particularly since uh, uh, I'm going to be also getting a flight that morning. Someone has very kindly offered to get me airborne. Anyway, I will uh, come down with bursting with uh, excitement, having gone around the Isle of Wight in a 172. So uh, I'll be doing that in the morning and then uh, be hanging around for everyone to pitch up. Uh, I know uh, um, someone called uh, Matt and uh, not some bloke I've never heard of called Carlos is pitching up. <laughs> um, uh, although fact that they are relative unknowns i have indeed invited them to my house afterwards uh that's uh, i'm afraid not an invitation i can put out to everyone unless nev you come in mate no i would love to but i shall still be coming back from brazil Ooh. that day so I won't you'll be having you'll be having a brazilian did you say so well, I, I hope not that's not the plan but um, he's I, having it off got, that weekend someone's got another idea possibly <laughs> <laughs> have a uh, have a sack wax, mate. That'll that'll make your eyes water. Family show, guys. Family show. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what a shame. Oh. But uh, yeah, we Thank we're gonna get yeah. we're gonna get some people flying in. So that that's always interesting when people. Oh, actually, good. I hope the weather's good enough for that. But uh, you never know because it's like October. Um, but we'll have plenty of people driving in, uh, and uh, it should be fun. It's it's the first um, kind of APG meetup I've had. Like uh, other than Farnborough um, uh, in the UK, so and it's so it's a, not a common event. Um, so yeah, get get down there if you can. It's the day that British summertime ends. So I think it's still British summertime at fourteen hundred in the afternoon. Correct yes. me if I'm wrong, somebody, no, but I think yeah. British summertime ticks over 
pardon me, late at night. Or perhaps it ticks over at 2 o'clock in the morning and it will actually be Zulu by then. But whatever, if you need to what, adjust your watches, make sure you've done so and pitch up there at 2 o'clock, whatever the local time is. Brilliant. And very much looking forward to that too as well. Um, just a bit of news um, for this week. Um, for, the, for those of you guys who follow me on Facebook or follow the show on Facebook, I have been lucky enough to get uh, a nice little entrance and, and tickets and pass and media accreditation for the Dubai Air Show, uh, which is next month. It's about a month's time, actually. Mm. Um, it starts on the 12th of November and goes on for a week. Uh, I shall be uh, flying out to Dubai, and uh, I'm going to be attending the uh, air show on the first day, on the Sunday. Uh, Who are you flying out well. with, uh, Carlos? Who am I flying out with? I am yeah, flying. I am flying out with um, the UK's premier. Uh, I think you're allowed to say airline. who they are, aren't you? Because not my airline. No, no. I'm actually flying out with uh, an airline that uh, both uh, Neville and uh, Nick will know very well. It's the uh, the world famous Virgin Atlantic. Um, ah, I thought it might those. be Acme Red. There no, no, no. It's Virgin. I couldn't get with Acme Red. Uh, unfortunately, their flights were oh. far too expensive. Uh, no, no, it's so. not that, mate. We blackballed you. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. But no, it was after that, after that last time <laughs> when you got pissed at the bar. <laughs> but uh, I, I am, I'm quite uh, um, uh, excited uh, that it'll be my first long haul flight on a Airbus A330. So that should be. Fairly interesting, I think. Uh, hang on a minute. It's saying like eight and a half hours, isn't it? That's not a long haul. It's, it's a nine-hour flight, I'll have you know. Well, nearly nine hours. Uh, it's, it's eight and a half hours. It, yeah. That's not long haul. Right? Obviously, it would be a lot quicker if it was uh, a, a Dreamliner. But there we go. So I shall be uh, attending <laughs> the uh, Dubai Air Show this year. I'm incredibly excited about the whole prospect. I was really, really chuffed when I got the email back from uh, the media team. Uh, at the show and uh, yeah it's uh, it's going to be really good because it, it's uh, unfortunately it's not a public event I didn't realize the the air show itself is a non-public event it's uh, purely for um, um, aerospace and uh, big the big companies that are there Airbus and Boeing and all the big manufacturers are going to be there as well as all the interior designers and, uh, for aircraft and that are going to be there uh, and I've got a well I've got to get myself uh, a suit um, so I'm currently in the process of having, well, me, Nev, and Matt are currently in the process of having uh, PTUK posh shirts made, actual nice posh shirts made. So I've got to wear those out there. And, um, well, yeah, thoroughly looking forward to it. So if you are listening and uh, you are in the UAE and you're going to the Dubai Air Show, uh, drop us a line uh, at the podcast at plaintalkinguk.com. Drop us a line. Let us know you're going to be there. It'd be nice to see some uh, people uh, there who listen to the show at uh, the Dubai Air Show 2017. So, yeah, that's that's my bit of news. Uh, anything from you at all, Nev? Uh, no, I'm not doing very much this week. Um, well, actually, no, I might be doing it. might be seeing possibly Captain L later in the week. <clears throat> I should be up in the northwest of England, but uh, obviously he might be a bit of a busy chap at the moment, so I'm going to try and meet up with him later in the week. And then I'm off to Brazil for a week and a bit on the 21st, on the Saturday. Um, so I shall be around for the Friday show, but then I should be off uh, across, heading west and south. Yeah, watch out Ooh. for the sheep. Uh, in the northwest of England or, or Brazil or both? <laughs> Where Captain Al lives. Indeed, yes. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And the ice cream uh, vans as well. Oh, I'm, you do just, know I'm sure he's got his own one. Al does yeah. like Are you going to go visit McCuntleth while you're there? <laughs> no, I'm not actually. <laughs> oh, okay. Fair and enough. on that it's, note. <laughs> <laughs> to those uh, enthusiasts who don't know, McCuntleth is where the Mac Loop is. It oh, actually is a, I'm sure it's Mr. a very Warner poor will abbreviation of the village there called McCuntleth. And there you go. <laughs> Anyhow, Neville shaking his head there. So before we uh, before we close up the show, then uh, Miss Mister Nick Anderson, would you like to give your uh, amazing podcast a little bit of a plug, please? 
yes, I would love to. It's uh, the Airline Pilot Guy show, and you can find us uh, at uh, airlinepilotguy.com. If you're looking for the website, you can find us on Twitter at Airline Pilot Guy. You can find us, sorry, uh, on Facebook at Airline Pilot Guy. Twitter, we use the handle at uh, APG Crew. We're on Slack, and for that, you'll have to speak to Halal, but I think he's hiding in Jeff's cupboard. Uh, so you probably won't hear how to do that. And um, generally speaking, we're around. Oh, and the, don't forget to go to uh, um, iTunes or wherever you get your uh, apps for your phone from and look for the APG app and install it on your phone because that's the one thing that PTUK haven't stolen from us yet. Rip, how very dare you, Nick. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> So anyway, Nev, moving on, uh, would you like to give uh, your wonderful uh, sites a plug, please? Yes, um, I. you can find me on uh, nevtech.org.uk, that's my own website. On Twitter, I am nevtech27, and if you want um, some very high-quality gags and puns, then you can find me on Facebook as well. So there we go, that's where we bring episode 186 of the Plain Talking UK podcast to a close. It's been a fairly traumatic uh, show for me. Matt, if you're listening, I'm looking very much forward to you coming back next week, hopefully. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, have you enjoyed yourselves, guys? Absolutely, yeah, pretty good. And yeah. um, I hope I've frightened off a lot of your audience. <laughs> no, thanks for coming on next, been absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. So we're going to give everyone a big wave and say a massive thanks to everyone who's joined us in the live chat room tonight on YouTube. And obviously, we're going to say a massive thanks as well to everyone who downloads the show each week via iTunes and all the other podcast platforms, Podbean and uh, Stitcher and all those other amazing uh, apps you can get for your phone. So a big thanks to everyone who downloads the show each week. Me, Matt and Nev really, really do appreciate uh, everyone who downloads the show and don't forget to tell your friends and your family if they want to uh, come and listen to us or watch the show live uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter Plain Talking UK so from the studio here at uh, PTUK Towers uh, it's a goodbye from me and it's goodbye from me have a nice week guys and girls and it's goodbye from him bye everyone <laughs> bye, bye. <Woo. laughs>